evening members and uh, welcome to this uh, meeting, of meeting of the full council of the BCP. I would like to welcome councillors to this virtual meeting of the BCP council together with members of the press and members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. I will now set out the housekeeping arrangements for the meeting. Please note that this meeting is being recorded by the Council for live and subsequent broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. In order to ensure the meeting is managed effectively, please could everyone follow these ground rules for speaking. Only speak when invited to by the chairman. Always turn your function when invited to speak. Please state your name before you speak if you have not been introduced by name. Some people may need to dial into the meeting and will therefore not have the benefit of the visual video. Please mute your microphone when you are not talking. If you wish to, if you would like to speak on an item, please do so by utilising the raise your hand feature on the bar at the top of the Teams window. Members will recall that we are working on a different platform this evening, a uh, software platform. Uh, as a reminder, don't forget to lower your hand once you've finished speaking. The messaging bar should not be used unless you are raising a point of order or providing the wording for a motion. Please remember that this panel is visible to all and subject to public information requests. Where there appears to be consensus in the meeting for the motion, I will ask if there is any dissension from the motion. If you wish to vote against the motion, please type against in the message panel. Otherwise, the motion will be agreed without a vote. The chief executive will indicate who has voted against. When a formal vote is required, this will be carried out by roll call, asking for a response of for, against or abstain from each councillor. A recorded vote requires support from a quarter of the members present. If a request for a recorded vote is made, unless I have received notification of the request and 25% of the meeting have already intimated they are in support, a roll call will be taken up to the point that a quarter of councillors present at the meeting support that request. Should my connection be lost during the meeting, the vice chairman will take the chair until my connection resumes. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and that mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. Thank you, members. The first item on uh, this evening's agenda is apologies. Uh, we, we, we received no apologies up until uh, later today when unfortunately one of the members uh, has a uh, personal problem and uh, they will try to join the meeting uh, as, as soon as possible. And, and that was um, Councillor Edwards, I believe. Agenda item two, declarations of interest. Chief Executive, can you report on any declaration of interest received, please? Thank you, Chairman. No, I've not received any declarations of interest for this evening's meeting. Thank you. Uh, agenda item three, confirmation of, of minutes. Councillors, are you happy to confirm the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held September and the extraordinary council meeting on the 1st of October? Is there any dissension, please? Councillor Brook. Fine, thank you, Chair. It's with reference to the tribute to Mike Wise. You were going to cover that. Yes, I, I will call you when I get to that point, Councillor Brook. Right, thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, there being no dissension for um, the minutes of the last meetings. Uh, uh, members, if you just bear with us, it would appear that uh, uh, hands are not showing on my my screen. So, uh, Chairman, I, I have a hand from right. Councillor Jude's butt. Uh, Councillor Jude's butt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just wondering, Mr. Chairman, did you need a seconder for the proposal of the minutes? If, I don't know if I heard one. If you do, do I'm happy to, to so propose. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. But I think normally we just um, note that the minutes are, are, are correct. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Butt. OK, in which case we will we'll say that confirm those as a correct record. Uh, moving on then to agenda item four uh, announcements uh, from myself. Members, I would like to report uh, on an inc incident following the extraordinary meeting of the council and a subsequent complaint which was dealt with by the standards committee. Just to confirm that I have accepted an apology from uh, Councillor Butt and uh, for the purpose of the record I will now read out uh, the letter that I received. Dear David, thank you for your letter dated the 2nd of October regarding Thursday's council meeting. I was somewhat thrown when Councillor Mark Howell spoke for what I believe was over four minutes answering an initial question that was posed at the beginning of the meeting. Listening carefully to all the speakers and was impressed by what felt like latitude in speakers being able to complete their presentations with some being longer than others. Councillor Slade, as you state, a case in point. I have been speaking in council for over 21 years and never overrun. I timed my one page presentation many times and was within 2.5, so 10 seconds spare. I was shocked when, with no warning of my time, you advised me I was out of time. In hindsight, it would have been appropriate to have stopped at your reference, but with the two sentences left, I thought with the above latitude given to Councillor Howell and Councillor Slade, I would have been allowed to finish. There are lessons to be learned from this, and I believe they are as follows. We are now in the realm of remote meetings and all difficulties that brings for all involved. In September's council meeting, several councillors overran and could not finish, so their final summations were lost to all members and the public, which was a de detriment to all present. We therefore would all benefit from a shared timing mechanism that you as chair and any speaker has sight of. A two minute 30 second warning that 30 seconds remain being incorporated in this mechanism would be extremely helpful too. This to enable good presentations and avoid situations where speakers overrun and you need to intervene. Could you possibly as chairman look into the possibility of making this facility available for council and potentially all committees that rely on a set of time presentations? I believe it would greatly assist the smooth running of those meetings. I'm very happy to offer you my sincere apologies regarding overrunning and not stopping when requested. I will ensure this does not happen again. I meant you no dis disrespect and understand your stance and why you felt it necessary to write to me. Thank you for your kind attention to my request. Best always, Jude's back. And following that, uh, members, I would just like to add that uh, we, we do have a um, clock uh, being displayed this evening. Um, it, it's not part of the package. It is remote. And so uh, we also have officers who are, are um, recording timings as well as. Uh, could I call upon Councillor Mike Brook, please? With regards to uh, um, the sad passing of uh, former Councillor Mike Wise. Councillor Brook. Fine, thank you, Chair. Mike Wise was first elected to Poolborough Council in 1983 as a Conservative councillor representing Creekmore Ward. But in 1985, 
he crossed the floor to join the SDP and Liberal opposition. Although he did not stand for re-election in 1987, he remained loyal to the Liberal Democrats for the rest of his life. Mike made his mark on both the amenities and housing committees, where his passion for community and those less fortunate than himself shone through. He was a long-standing governor at Long Space School, chairman of Poole Council for Voluntary Service from 1981 to 1986, and later became a non-executive director of South East Dorset Primary Care Trust, chairing its palliative care group. Mike was truly inspirational. He had the ability and determination to turn dreams into reality. When the opportunity arose to lease an old farmhouse and buildings in Lichet Minster, he quickly set about converting them into a centre for local crafts. And in mid-1987, the Courtyard Centre opened its doors to the public for the first time. It was here that Mike met and subsequently developed a strong friendship with Julia Perks, a local children's nurse whose aspiration was to provide a hospice and respite care service for Dorset children. Sadly, Julia died prematurely from cancer, but Mike subsequently dedicated all his time and energy ensuring Julia's dream would be realised. He established the charity Julia's House in 1997 and was awarded an MBE for his work in 2007. Mike died on the 16th of November, aged 84, after a long battle with Parkinson's disease. So many families and individuals will be forever grateful for Mike's passion and commitment, and no one can doubt the immense legacy he leaves. Our thoughts and prayers go out to his family. Mike, rest in peace. Thank you, Councillor Brooke. I'd now like to ask the council uh, to uh, join me in a silent tribute to the former councillor, Mike Wise. Thank you. Agenda item five, public issues. Uh, firstly, public questions. In accordance with the constitution, the following public questions have been published on the website and the link circulated to all councillors. Responses to these questions have also been published on the council's website. And I would just run through uh, uh, those members of the public who have taken the time to write in. Uh, Marion Pope uh, on the Greenbelt, Helen Ash on the TROs, Susan Lennon, Overview and Scrutiny, uh, Climate Change and Other Associated Issues, uh, Louisa Lindsay, uh, sorry, Louisa Lindsay Clark, Dr. Philippa Gillingham, Emma Appleton, Dr. Kerry Edwards Hawthorne, James Appleton, Julia Card, Claire Anderson, Mrs. Wilkinson, Tina Cresswell, Dan Willis, Peter Estall, Melissa Carrington, Helen Woodall, Mary Thornton, Marcus Fidge, Ellen Dexter, Helen Nicholl, Amanda Dilworth, Emma Draper, Hannah Houston, 
Mike Oates, Francesca Hall, Pat Mathy, Clive Block, Anita Rose, Louise Kensington, Alistair Keddy, Mark Sanders, and Connor Luby with regards to noise levels. Uh, statements. Uh, in accordance with the Constitution, the statement received as follows, uh, Mr. Conor Oluby, uh, regarding proportional voting system. This has been posted on the website and a link circulated to all councillors. Uh, petitions. There have been no uh, petitions submitted for this council meeting. Moving on then to agenda item six. Recommendations from Cabinet and other committees. Members, uh, you are asked to consider the following recommendations, uh, which will be taken separately. Item 6A, Health and Adult Social Care Overview and Scrutiny Committee of the 2nd of March 2020. Minute number 65, the big plan, 2018-21 commissioning, strategy for adults with learning disabilities, uh, progress report, Bill of Rights. Can I call upon uh, Councillor Karen Rampton, who I understand will move the recommendations, and I also call on uh, Councillor Diane, Diana Butler, uh, who will second the motion. Uh, Councillor Rampton, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I'm really pleased to present the Bill of Rights Charter, which belongs to our People First Forum. The Charter was first written by people with learning disabilities back in 2004 and has been updated since then and was adopted by the preceding councils of Bournemouth and Poole, but has not to date been adopted by Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole Council. People first spoke to us at an all-member seminar in October, and I'm sure all members who virtually attended will agree it was a great presentation. The rights in this charter are ones that many of us take for granted, and it actually feels quite uncomfortable that this charter is needed and that people with learning disabilities in BCP have to ask for our support for those basic rights. So I would very much expect that all members will not only support this Bill of Rights, but will personally pledge that we will honour them in all the plans that we make. I recommend this to Council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Rampton. Uh, Councillor Diana Butler, please. Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, actually, I would I would love to second this recommendation to Council. Um, I heard the presentation when they gave it to the Health and Adult uh, Social Care Overview and Scrutiny in March, and also they repeated it as uh, Councillor Rampton said in October to councillors who attended the virtual meeting. Um, it's a fantastic piece of work. It's really well written. It's well presented. It's clearly defined. Um, you can see it um, in the in the um, information that we hold on the council. And um, as a sort of concise piece, it says it all really. And as part of the Equality Act, I feel that um, we should support this anyway. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, others wishing to speak on uh, this motion, please. I don't appear to have any uh, hand signals, and so therefore uh, I will move to the vote. And voting will be by consensus uh, unless uh, there are any members wishing to vote against. Uh, if you could please show in the uh, conversation bar. Thank you very much. I'll take that as a unanimous vote. Thank you. Moving on then, members, to item 6B, 
the licensing committee 17th September 2020 minute number eight the licensing act 2003 statement of licensing policy can I call upon uh, councillor Jude Butt please who I understand will uh, propose the motion uh, together with uh, councillor Judy Bagwell who will second uh, councillor Butt please Thank you, Mr Chairman. <clears throat> Mr Chairman, under the Licensing Act 2003, the Licensing Authority of BCP Council is responsible for the sale of alcohol by retail, the supply of alcohol by or, or on behalf of a member of a club, the provision of regulated entertainment and the provision of late light refreshment. The BCP Licensing Authority is required to carry out its functions under the Licensing Act 2003 with a view to promoting the four stated licensing objectives being the prevention of crime and disorder, public safety, the prevention of public nuisance and protection of children from harm. The licensing authority of BCP Council is required by Section 5 of the Licensing Act 2003 at five year intervals to determine and publish a statement of licensing policy. The devolved boroughs of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole have all previously published individual policies. The Local Government Structural Changes General Amendment Regulations 218 provides that a licensing authority has 24 months from the date of reorganisation being the 1st of April 2019 to prepare and publish a statement of licensing policy for the new local government area. Before determining a revised statement of licensing policy, the licensing authority must consult with persons listed in Section 5, Subsection 3 of the 2003 Act. Guidance issued under Section 182 of the 2003 Act states that during a five year period, the policy must be kept under review and the licensing authority may make any revisions to it as it considers appropriate. On the 18th of December 2019, the licensing committee was presented with the first draft of the proposed statement of licensing policy. Public consultation commenced on the 1st of January 2020 for 12 weeks. This was undertaken via the BCP consultation tracker on the website and via email to all parties as stated in Appendix B of the policy document. Following significant feedback and proposed amendments, an additional six week consultation was commenced on the 18th of May 2020. This was sent via email to all persons and bodies as stated in Appendix B of the policy document. Although somewhat hampered by the COVID pandemic, all consultation responses were collated and discussed at length by the licensing committee on the 17th of September 2020. And at that meeting, the final version of the policy was agreed. And I have pleasure, Mr Chairman, in presenting the completed statement of licensing policy to the Council for adoption this evening. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Butt. Uh, Councillor Julie Bagwell, please. Councillor Bagwell. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'm very happy to second the Chairman of the Licensing Committee's proposal that the Council adopt the 2020 BCP Licensing Authority Statement of Licensing Policy. We would both like to thank all members of the Licensing Committee for the work undertaken to collate and contribute the three preceding Council Statements of Licensing Policy and the dedication of the Licensing Officer Team, especially during COVID, to deliver the completed document. Special thanks, which we would ask to be recorded, go to Mr Frank Wenzel, past BCP Licensing Manager, after a long successful career with Borough of Poole, whose last huge task was to rewrite and collate the three separate councils' statement of licensing policy into the document you have before you today. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I so second Councillor Butt's proposal. Thank you, Councillor Bagwell. Uh, I have a notification that Councillor Trent uh, would like to speak. Councillor Tony Trent, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have three questions for the Chairman of Licensing, so I'll roll them into one to try to keep it brief. Um, on on 8.16 of the report, it says that um, there's an unified music being used if it's in support of um, traditional um, dancing, such as Morris dancing or similar. And I just wonder whether the chairman can confirm that that would include traditional music from other cultures. So if we do um, an event um, to to promote diversity, that we accept Bangra, Sota and other forms of traditional music under the same exemption. That's the first question. 9.1, there's reference to queuing for fast food outlets and similar causing um, issues. 
does that mean that in future I would be able to uh, refer my um, complaint that I've had about um, a certain fast food outlet um, having such a large number of people turning up at their takeaways, it blocks main main roads and cuts off bus services. Is licensing the appropriate place to go to for that? And on a lighter note, Tenthen, um, I wonder if the chairman could describe to me what a vertical establishment is. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Trent. Uh, Councillor Bag, uh, Councillor Butt, please. Yes, well, I'll do my best. Uh, thank you for your questions, uh, Councillor Trent. Firstly, the exemption with regard to Morris dancing, um, I think that's something that we could include, and I think it's a very good point, actually. Um, I um, will um, ask that we um, amend that in light of what you have said so that the wording is correct, so that we are diverse in our applications because uh, it's a form of dance. Morris dancing is very traditionally British, but we have many, many other dances which are also very traditional, which we have uh, uh, adopted in our country and which we'd be very happy to see. So um, I can um, ask that that be done for you. With regards to the other query on queuing, I think you asked about 9.1, which I'm just pulling up in front of me. Uh, 9.1 Oh, da, da, da. I'll find it. In some, is this what you're talking about? In some areas where the number, type or density of licensed premises, such as those selling alcohol, providing late night refreshments is higher, exceptional, serious problems of nuisance and disorder may arise outside some distance of those premises. Such problems generally occur as a result of large numbers of drinkers. The cumulative impact of a concentration of licensing premises. We don't have a cumulative impact policy. We haven't adopted that as such. Um, but I think what this is saying is it's saying that obviously all these matters have to be considered when somebody is making an application. So they need to be careful as to to provide for these types of occurrences. So I'm not sure that you coming to the licensing committee would serve you very well, Councillor Trent, but I'm sure if you ask the licensing officer, they'd be happy to help. And with regard to your last question, which is 10 point, can you take me to the point again, Councillor Trent? 10.7, I think you said? 10.07. Uh, 10.07, okay, I'll try and find that. It's a large term. 10 10.07, well, I've only got 10.7. Uh, 10.7, and you've asked me what a vertical, I can't actually see it in 10.7. You asked me what a vertical something was. Oh, you've got it there. Yeah. Vertical drinking establishments. Well, I'll be absolutely frank with you, Mr. Trent. I'm afraid I'm not entirely certain what the phraseology means with regard to a vertical drinking establishment. I might have to ask our monitoring officer to see if she might know that, but I'm sure I can get an answer for you and then I'll be able to advise you exactly what that is. So I hope that's helpful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Trent, for your questions. Yeah, can I can I just um, clarify um, 9.1? It was the last sentence in it. Um, regarding queuing outside fast food establishments, um, because although the queuing at um, this certain fast food establishment in Older Road, and I think there's a similar one in Christchurch, um, is it's a takeaway and the queue is motorised, um, I would certainly find it useful if if. It could be I clarified think, whether I could I bring think I up. could help you there, Councillor Trent. I don't think matter. I think we're talking about the, the troubles that we're facing with, with regard to COVID. Uh, I think it might be better if the question was was put to our, our COVID expert, uh, Councillor Green, Nicola Green, who may be able to assist us to exactly what's happening there. But I think any cues at the moment certainly wouldn't be down to licensing. I think they'd be down to perhaps our COVID marshals, of which we're hoping to have six more this evening. But it may be that uh, Councillor Green would be able to help you further. Thank you, Councillor Trent. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Butt. Thank you, Councillor Trent. And I understand that a vertical establishment is one with few seats, but uh, serves food. Thank so you, I'm Mr just, Chairman. I am, I am uh, most grateful to you. No, thank, thanks to the officer for that, who uh, very kindly um, uh, put a, a note up on the, uh, on the taskbar for me. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Jill. Are there any further questions? Uh, or debate with regards to uh, item 6B. If you please, uh, Chair, Councillor Falkler speaking. 
Uh, yes, please, Councillor Farquhar. I do apologise, members, but the the software doesn't appear to be working on my screen. So members are raising hands and it's not showing up on my screen, unfortunately. Uh, Councillor Farquhar. Yes, thank you. Uh, just to confirm, Chair, it's uh, it's not flagging, it's not toggling on and off on my screen either, so um, it may be a problem right across the board. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the report, um, uh, Councillor Butt. Uh, I was pleased to work on um, the, the immense amount of work to, to bring the three policies together. Um, and uh, I was uh, uh, very pleased to hear that you uh, thanked uh, uh, our officer Frank, um, who did a tremendous amount of work. Um, I would uh, invite you to also thank uh, uh, the officer Nananka Randall, um, who actually landed it um, in, in the finish um, and put in arguably um, a, tr a tremendous amount of work, uh, more so than I've uh, seen of, uh, uh, of many of our colleagues. Um, so, uh, I would invite you to uh, perhaps uh, make mention of uh, Nananka Randall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Farquhar. Uh, any further speakers, please? Uh, Councillor Andy Handley. Um, as a new member of the, uh, um, of the licensing committee, I, I um, uh, read it carefully and I've got, just got three drafting uh, um, issues which are very simple. The first is in uh, um, uh, paragraph 7.5, the word appropriate is, is not appropriately spelt. Um, so that's a very simple one. Um, under 817, um, it talks about travelling circuses and then it has an exception about exhibition. It has time uh, um, constraints, 8am to 11 um, And I just think the wording of that is unfortunately confusing in terms of whether the time constraints apply to the exception or apply to the uh, uh, um, travelling circuses accept the exceptions or to both. Um, I don't think that's very clear. And under 10.10, .10, there's um, some text which is marked in red with no explanation why. I think that's just a simple, simple typographical error. I suspect, you know, it's a big document and these things happen, but I just thought I'd point this out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Uh, Councillor Buck, please. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, um, clearly there are some typographical errors. There are also some grammar errors, missing full etc. ofs and ons. They will all, of course, be, be altered. Um, could you take me, please, Councillor, to the issue you've raised about um, the clumsy wording in 18 point something? 18.17, um, travelling circuses are exempt from entertaining licence in respect to all descriptions of entertainment, except boxing, wrestling and entertainment, where the entertainment or sport takes place. PM. It may be in terms of that. I can't hear you uh, very well, um, Councillor. I'm sorry about that. Well, uh, that um, I, I'm quite happy with that, but um, I will ask our officer, uh, Jill, I think Jill Holyoke is with us, whether um, she has um, any amendment that she might like to make to that. It reads OK to me. I can't actually um, access it at the moment because my system's down, um, but I'm quite happy with that. But as to typographical errors and um, amendments and grammar, that will all, of course, be altered before the document is, is um, uh, fully completed and printed out on on our website. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butt. Uh, any further speakers, please? No, in which case I will move to the vote. Uh, once again, a consensus vote. So if anybody, uh, any member wishes uh, to vote against or abstain, if they could show in the, uh, the chat bar, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take that as a unanimous vote. Thank you. Uh, moving on then to uh, item 6C, Cabinet 30th of September 2020, minute number 239, Highway Maintenance Funding 2020-21 report. Can I call upon uh, Councillor Mike Green, please? Councillor Green. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this is a request for Council to confirm planned programme of maintenance for our highways and structures. The spend comprises just over £7 million of capital allocated in the summer by the government as part of its pothole and challenge funds, as well as a further 700000 of previously awarded capital. It was examined by a view and scrutiny panel on the 21st of September, and then it was taken through Cabinet by Councillor Hadley and Councillor Rice 
on the 30th of September before the change of administration. And given that history, Mr Chairman, I'd just like to move these recommendations and ask that they be formally seconded by my colleague, Councillor Mark Anderson. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Mark Anderson, please. Thank you, Chairman. I'm happy to formally second this. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any members wishing to speak on this item? It would appear not, in which case I will once again move to the vote, voting by uh, consensus. Uh, if, if there are any members wishing to vote against or abstain from the vote, if they could show in the, ta the uh, conversation taskbar, please. Thank you once again, uh, unanimous vote. Moving on then to item 6D, uh, Cabinet from the 30th of September 2020, minute number 241, flood defences, Paul Bridge to Hunger Hill. Uh, can I call upon uh, Councillor Mark Anderson to uh, introduce the item, please? Uh, thank you, Chairman. It's uh, basically, as uh, the previous article uh, raised by Councillor Green, it came to ONS on the 21st of October, went to Cabinet under the previous administration on the 30th of September. Uh, I was happy to support it then and I'm happy to continue supporting it now. It's basically, it is to improve the flood defences for Pool Old Town, basically from Hunger Hill to Pool Bridge, and this is to fit in with the work that's been done by the Environment Agency and Paul Harbour Commission on the flood uh, risk alleviation that they have done. Um, further to the Cabinet meeting on the 30th of September, it was sent to the Environment Agency and they, and because the cost of the scheme is over £10 million, it had to go to the Environment Agency's large project group, which met on the 12th of November and the feedback we've been given is that it went down very well and we're hoping that the scheme will be agreed in the near future. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. I understand you have a seconder in Councillor Iyengar. Councillor Iyengar? Yes, th thank you, Chairman. I'm delighted to second this. Um, I know the stretch very well from Pool Bridge to Hunger Hill. It's got a variety of landlords along that stretch, so I'm, I'm doubly delighted the Council is taking a lead on this to uh, bring everyone together and pop the grant money in and then just move this forward uh, with, some, uh, with some purpose. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hand Hadley, you wish to speak? Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, very much welcome welcomes this uh, um, report and, and the long term that this is a very long term project. It is it is about flood defences up to the year 2105, uh, long past when we personally might be worried about it. Um, I think the one issue that, that arises from it, though, is, is that um, as part of trying to unblock this development previously, um, they were rated as zero sill. Um, and clearly that was on the basis that there were significant costs around the flood defences for anyone developing these sites. Um, and I, I would like to be assured that we are looking to reintroduce SIL um, so that there is, is community benefit from any developments taking place here. But very much in terms of the defences to the old town, I welcome this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Uh, Councillor Mark Howell, please. Councillor Howell. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to um, echo what Councillor Hadley has just said as a, a pool town councillor and one of the uh, portfolio holders in the previous minister administration that brought this forward. This is uh, a really good news for the town centre and hopefully will aid uh, the regeneration that, uh, that we're looking to achieve in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. If there are no further speakers, uh, I will once again move to the vote and once again by consensus if members wishing to vote against or abstain if they could show in the conversation taskbar please.
Thank you very much. Once again, a unanimous vote. Uh, moving on then to item 6E, uh, Cabinet 11th of November 2020, Minute 249, Western Gateway Rail Strategy. Councillor Mike Green, please. Thank you, Chairman. The first thing that one learns about rail, the way rail planning works is it's very long term. And this strategy has been put together by the Western Gateway um, Subnational Transport Body, which is a group of a dozen or so local authorities stretching from Christchurch to Bristol, which was set up in 2018 in response to government indications that they expect future funding of major transport infrastructure to follow a regional approach. It's, it's a colossal piece of work. It runs to over 200 pages, but it's very much not a detailed wish list from the local authorities. Uh, rather, it sort of sketches out our collective hopes and aspirations for the next 20, 20 plus years. In very broad terms, it focuses on five themes. Um, first is choice to make rail an attractive option compared with road through improved frequency, connections and reliability. Decarbonisation, which is to reduce the carbon footprint of the network primarily by looking at alternatives to diesel for rolling stock and also attracting freight, which otherwise would be transported by road. Social mobility is the third one, recognising rail as part of a sustainable transport network, and making it affordable and accessible to all. Productivity, improving reliability and reducing journey time so it's comparable with rate and providing connectivity with other transport hubs such as ports and airports. And the final one is growth, which is to ensure that the rail network is an enabler for growth in the locations which have been identified as desirable in local plans, other studies and, and policies. Um, I could go on for it about it for hours, Mr Chairman, given all the rest of the business we've got to go through this evening. I, I'll just uh, thank the officers who are involved in it and also my predecessor, uh, Councillor Hadley, um, and say that the strategy has been approved by the Western Gateway Board. Is now with the constituent local councils their approval and it's it, that's what the recommendations i'm moving today are seeking thank you mr chairman thank you councillor green i understand you have a, a seconder in uh, councillor philip broadhead councillor broadhead yes thank you very much mr chairman happy to uh, second this um uh, this this um recommendation um uh, councillor green has said most of the things that need saying uh, particularly around the the different areas that this uh, long term strategy focuses on uh, within my portfolio particularly uh, cover the productivity and growth and of course as we all know it's vital that we look long term uh, in these things to progress those areas um, we have a little bit of a choice uh, within this whether we look down towards the southwest or whether we look towards the western gateway um, um, it seems that we have more in common with our partners within the Western Gateway region, hence the reason for adopting this strategy. So very happy to second. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, right, I currently have two members wishing to speak. Councillor Tony Trent, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I was a little sort of um, confused. It's the, there are two quite large booklets involved and there doesn't seem to have been a covering report as such. And it sort of says under B, pursue the six route maps as identified in the rail strategy and support the development of any business cases or feas feasibility studies arising. Um, I kind of have to say, I don't quite know what it is. What it's referring to, um, what are these six route maps? Are they six proposed routes or six routes that need particular attention? Um, as I say, normally there's a covering report which kind of explains what it is that um, the um, cabinet are supporting in particular. And this doesn't seem to have any of that information on it. So I'm wondering whether someone can explain to me exactly what these six route maps are that are being proposed and whereabouts I find them. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Councillor Trent. Councillor Green, are you able to assist, please? I, I hope so, Chairman, and um, I, I did give a much better, a, a much longer explanation for this um, during the, the Cabinet session, which is a, a real favourite at the moment on YouTube, if anyone would like to go on to it, including Councillor Trent. Um, the reason for the two documents is that the first document is the, the full strategy and the explanation. And as it does say in the introduction to that, the second document is the sort of glossy that then is used to go forward to government 
um, for funding uh, applications, et cetera, in the future. So it's really the advertising one. Um, I also said at Cabinet that it's unfortunate that the word route map is used um, because it, that means normally something very, very different when it comes to transport policy and transport plans. In, in this case, route maps is not getting from A to B as far as physical uh, locations are concerned. Um, there are, within those five themes that I mentioned, there are 23 measurable outputs um, which are um, identified within both of those two reports that you spoke about. And those are described, actually the word they use, I think conditional, um, conditional outputs or, or, or outcomes. Um, and the route maps are the six ways that the task, task groups that are, are trying to make sure that these delivered over the next 20 years will be expected to tick off each of those 23 outcomes uh, that are required um, across those different schemes. And the, the route maps, which are identified, I think, towards the back of that second document that you spoke about, are, are actually the uh, the milestones and that each of them is going to be achieved. So that is the, the, the what the word route map means in this case. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. Thank you. Uh, I think I know. That. I think that makes sense. Thank you, Councillor Trent. Uh, Councillor Andy Hadley, please. Councillor Hadley. Thank you. Um, I thank Councillor Green for for the for the name check. Um, both he and I, th I think, at different times, spent a lot of time in Trowbridge talking through uh, um, the detail of the, uh, of this. Um, a, a couple of things for me. I think, um, as as Councillor Green said, it's a very long term project. Long before I was a councillor, twenty years ago, I was I was agitating to make better use of the railway line through the conurbation to try and unlock congestion. Um, and uh, um, and it got to the plans, and this is taking it slightly further forward in the plans, which I really welcome. And as part of the detail of it, um, the Dorset Connectivity Study, which will be happening this year. Um, and a concept of trying to get to four to six trains per hour across the conurbation, uh, which would be brilliant. But um, the big sticking point on that is unfortunately pool level crossing, uh, um, which uh, which is an issue for network rail. So so that's one of the challenges that we we, we, we face. Um, but links to Orange Railway and integrated ticketing with the other key things. I think it's notable, and it was in 2.6.8, um, that Pool and Bournemouth are highlighted in there as being the worst connected um, stations across the whole of the, the Western Gateway area. So we have a long way to go. Um, and I think the other thing to, to mention is that, that our officers, our BCP officers, were leading this piece of work across the Western Gateway. So um, you know, congratulations to them. Thank you for them for all their work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Uh, I have no further members wishing to speak on the item. Uh, therefore, I will move to the vote. And once again, uh, if members wishing to vote against or abstain from uh, voting, if you could uh, show in the taskbar, please. Thank you very much. Once again, a uh, unanimous vote. Uh, moving on then to item 6F, uh, Cabinet. 11 for November 2020, minute 250, recladding of Sturt Court blocks, uh, HRA. Uh, Councillor Bob Lawton. Councillor Lawton, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Early in 2020, new guidelines were. Early in 2020, new guidelines were issued by the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government regarding uh, cladding on buildings over 18 metres. In April 2020, the Council became aware of these change in guidelines. Therefore, it is recommended that the Council approve the award of a contract to, to, for modification to the United Living to the value of 3.84 million in order to deliver the removal of the cladding system and installation of a new cladding system at Sturt Court, together with a budget of a quarter of a million for unexpected works and a 5% project contingency allowance, and delegate authority to the Director of Housing to agree the detailed terms in liaison with the Section 151 officer and monitoring officer to enter into the relevant agreement. 
scheme proves the waiver of the right to charge leaseholders the cost of the works, which may otherwise be recoverable from the, for the reasons set out in Appendix B. Approve the budget vehement of 3.816 million within the HRA in order to support the delivery of the works. Approve the delegation of the 151 officer to finalise the details and authorise submission of a bid to the MHCLG approving to seek a government grant to approve the works. Can I just say, Chairman, that that is a large amount of money which we're uh, asking the council to approve. Uh, but at the same time, I would argue that what price do you put on safety for our residents? And secondly, can I thank the officers and the previous portfolio holder for their hard work in bringing this paper forward? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Norton. I understand you have a seconder in uh, Councillor Karen Rampton. Councillor Rampton, please. That's, that's correct. Thank you, Chair. Happy to second. Thank you very much. Uh, members, before uh, we, we move to debate, um, I would just like to note that one of the appendices is exempt, and therefore, if any member wishes to comment or discuss the appendix, then the press and the public will need to be dis uh, be excluded. So can I ask uh, those members uh, wishing to speak that can you please uh, acknowledge whether you wish to uh, debate any part of those appendices uh, before before uh, your comment, please? And then we can uh, move to uh, to the exempt item. Councillor Sandra Moore, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, mine is actually a, um, a very general comment. Um, I just wanted to say that I was a former pool council rep on the PHP board and although the refurbishment work at Sturt Court was started before my time, I was a member when the uh, poor workmanship issues around the contractors arose and I did take part in the discussions which followed and I can recall how concerned everyone in PHP were um, and how they um, all wanted to do everything possible to help their tenants. And I do think that concerns post the terrible Grenfell tragedy have inevitably served to focus much more attention on fire risk in tower blocks, and, and quite rightly so. And it would seem that everyone, including council and government departments, are now much better aware and have access to improved and more detailed information than they were previously, which is clearly very helpful. And I am happy to support this paper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, Councillor Hadley. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, as, as Ward Councillor, um, and immediately following the Grenfell fire, I, I was in, in, involved in talking with, with the residents within this, 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 this block uh, of these blocks. Um, and I very much support the, 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 the um, paper. I also support, and without going into the detail of Appendix B, I, I support um, us uh, um, uh, um, wavering our, our, the right to charge leaseholders. I think this is about remedial work for, for uh, um, uh, um, bad workmanship in the first place, which they paid for, um, along with, with the, the, those who are, are renting, and, and also, obviously, the, the, uh, um, the, the higher standards that are being. So I support this, and, and um, I, I'm pleased that we are not uh, going back to the leaseholders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Uh, Councillor Kieran Wilson, please. Councillor Wilson. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll, I'll keep this brief uh, because the previous speakers have kind of summarised what I wanted to say. But um, yeah, I just want to thank all the officers um, who uh, went through this process and, and put a lot of time into this report. Um, and I, I very much fully support it. Um, I think as the previous, as the portfolio holder has said, um, you can't you can't put a price on on resident safety. And um, that's what this is all about. So, yeah, very much um, supportive of this paper. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Trent, please. Councillor Trent. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, the, the one thing I, I wanted to point out in all of that, um, the portfolio holder made reference to um, it's a lot of money for the council to find, but the housing revenue account is money that was paid in by um, tenants, and it's basically tenant money. And um, I was involved in the battle that went on for many years trying to stop money being taken out of that uh, by by government and used for other purposes. What I also want to say in all of this, because I'm sure there's going to be some 
discussion. In fact, I'm sure it's on a forward plan somewhere about the um, the way um, pool housing partnership works in future. Um, it has had in the past a very good uh, record of um, tenant involvement. And I'm really hoping that the portfolio holder and others involved in future discussions remember that at one time, um, you know, it was an exceptional situation and that we, we must make sure that into the future, and this actually keeps it um, hopefully away from some, some of the problems that we found in Grenville, will, should still remain at the heart of the um, running of poor housing partnership or or whatever, because um, as I say, it was one of the first, um, always one of the first places in the country way back in the 60s to get tenant involvement. And as I say, it's an exemplary um, thing that was carried through to poor housing partnership. And I'm really hoping that that is borne in mind. And remember that housing revenue account is money that's been paid in rent by tenants. And I just really wanted to make that point clear. Thank you, Councillor Trent. Councillor Lawton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And can I thank the three of your speakers for their support? Uh, it's most welcome. Can I just uh, make a point to Councillor Trent? That, uh, can I just make a point to Councillor Trent that uh, resident involvement is at the heart of my portfolio. It was when I was a councillor in Bournemouth. It, it hasn't changed and won't change now that we're BCP, and I shall certainly take account of his views. And uh, again, I would like to thank Councillor Hadley, Councillor Moore, Councillor Wilson for their support for this paper. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lawton. Uh, occasion of uh, members wishing to speak, I will therefore move once again to the vote. Uh, if uh, members wish to abstain or vote against, could you please show in the uh, conversation taskbar? Once again, unanimous vote. Thank you, members. Uh, moving on then to item 6G, uh, Cabinet, the 11th of November 2020, minute number 254, 2020-21 budget monitoring and medium term financial plan update. Um, Councillor Bella, please. Councillor Drew Meller. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, and good evening. Um, Chair, I'll be brief this, as, as the the other papers, this has been through the overview and scrutiny process fully, um, really good um, debate and engagement there, and uh, we, we took this through Cabinet. Um, this takes us to, refreshes the MTFP period, so it moves um, into the three-year period from 21-22, uh, going all the way to 23-24. Um, it you know, uh, goes without saying, but it's a, a huge amount of work in terms of this COVID uh, environment we've had to deal with. Uh, and you know, very very proud of the the, the um, work officers are doing. They've been able to um, pivot on information that's changing daily and and also quite materially. Uh, in terms of the out, outturn of this, we're looking at you know we we started with a 49.1 million uh, deficit through various um, movements. That in this report goes to 13.4. Uh, the, the job's certainly not done. There's a lot lot more work to do both now and in preceding years. Um, we await. Uh, the the government um, uh, you know contribution and the funding settlement for the next next year, which comes uh, comes out on Wednesday. Uh, I won't uh, take the uh, council's time any longer. I look forward to ask, answering any questions. Um, look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mellor. I believe you have a seconder in Councillor Philip Broadhead. Councillor Broadhead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, again, Mr Chairman, more than happy to uh, second this recommendation. As Councillor Mella has uh, suggested, we've spent an awful lot of time on this already uh, through both the scrutiny process and the cabinet process where many, many questions have been asked. So um, uh, happy to second and take this through for Council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, Councillor Mike Brook, please. Fine, thank you, Chair. Um, overall, I'm quite happy with the, the two rec recommendations and probably will be st supporting that but i wonder if uh, the leader and uh, portfolio holder for finance could just clarify a couple of points for me um i noticed reading through the re the the report and the information there is a very very high dependency on um not filling staffing vacancies um this does give me a little bit of 
concern on the basis that there are already some service units that are struggling um, and definitely need uh, their vacancies filling or additional staff. So I'm just concerned that the widespread use of um, not completing the not fulfilling vacancies um, might well affect service delivery and thus the reputation of the council. And the second question or second clarification, you make reference that there are certain member priorities, including a number that relate to the uh, council's position on climate and ecological emergency, which are to be delayed. But at the same time as these are being delayed, you are claiming that there are new priorities that have been identified and uh, work is going ahead with those. Uh, I don't think any of us are actually aware of uh, what those new priority areas are and why is uh, the climate emergency and ecological emergency that Council has declared and supported being um, impacted by delays. Councillor Miller. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mike, for that for that question. Uh, two questions. Uh, in terms of the the first point relating to staffing vacancies, yes, you're right. You'll also be aware that we're in the process of a, a large scale transformation um, uh, program, where the ultimate aim is to uh, deliver 43.9 million pounds worth of recurring savings. A large part of that will come through reduction in headcount as we become a more efficient authority. Um, I, I believe you'll also be aware we have a 15 million pound target for, for that reduction in, in year. Um, I believe a lot of that is possible through um, doing some analysis of, of job families, effectively taking a really organisational approach rather than a departmental approach to um, to delivering delivering efficient back office services. So, uh, so, so some staff vacancies won't be filled, we, but we think the overall aim for this transformation program is to uh, effectively create significant sums of you know cash headroom that we can you know uh, prioritise uh, frontline services. So ultimately, this will get us to a position where um, frontline services are, are absolutely uh, saved, and we can look forward to priorities. That that moves on to your second question. In, in terms of priorities, uh, so uh, you know, we this administration hasn't delayed any um, any spending programs in relation to uh, the climate and ecological emergency. That that's historic. That's effectively what the Unity Alliance administration uh, did as part of its massive budget um, uh, saving exercise. We are bringing forward new new uh, new priority areas. There's a question later. Um, uh, which has some detail on that and also those priority areas both now uh, are, um, in terms of what we're spending in this financial year will come forward um, in the next cabinet paper um, so the next cabinet we're looking forward to bring um, and then you'll also see that the, the budget refresh one commitment we have got is we will not be cancelling priorities we'll be making sure there is money uh, available to to invest in in priorities of this council and of our administration uh, you, you make reference uh, also to the climate and ecological emergency. I'd just like to say that, you know, as, as you've seen historically in our budget reset paper and something we're, we're looking at now, we've talked about, you know, delivering more money to the climate and ecological emergency or at some real substantial money. We've talked about uh, a potential use of the uh, community municipal bond as, as one way of doing that. We're absolutely signed up and committed wholeheartedly to the climate and ecological emergency. We will be de um, delivering uh, real projects um, uh, that en enable us to start to uh, uh, hit those targets. So I hope that uh, answers your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Councillor Myers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as this update clearly uh, clearly says, the setting of a, a robust and lawfully balanced budget will be extremely challenging. Every council in the country, and in fact most every business and household, are facing extreme levels of uncertainty. It was pleasing, therefore, to report, uh, to read, actually, the conclusions of the BCP auditors who report, and I quote, members have a fiduciary duty to maintain sound finance and not to take steps that would mortgage the future. They go on, investment is, is certainly required, but this must be done in a considered and a balanced way. They conclude that BCP Council has managed in its first year in an effective manner and throughout has been focused on ensuring its financial sustainability. The Council reacted quickly to the pandemic and has spent significant time focusing on measures to achieve financial sustainability. 
We believe members are fully aware of the risks and the dangers of running down reserves. This was indeed high praise from a firm of qualified chartered accountants. So claiming credits for reducing the financial deficit as you just have done within weeks of taking over just demonstrates an ego that is in need of significant stroking. Claiming credit for other people's work is the definition of a modern day pirate. As Grant Thornton testified, the UA took a reserved and prudent view when it comes to taking credit for income and savings. Money was borrowed to invest, not to cover shortfalls in income. These are perhaps old fashioned and, you know, some would say conservative with a small c values, but badly needed in this, this in today's world. Turning to the recommendations before us, however, uh, to the Council, it's important that the audit and governance review uh, reviews the financial regulations, providing that there are providing that these new provisions put transparency at the heart of any changes. Let's have no return to the bad old days in Bournemouth. I would also welcome the revenue and the capital environments in respect of the next steps accommodation grant and indeed the much needed investment in the Boscombe town regeneration and would recommend both of these UA inspired initiatives to the council. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cox. Uh, I have no further speakers. Uh, in which case I will move to the vote and once again by uh, consensus. Can I ask member wishing to vote against or uh, to abstain to um, present their uh, requirements in the task bar, please, the conversation task bar? Uh, thank you. Councillor Butler. Thank you very much. Moving on then, members, to item 6H, Cabinet, 11th of November 2020, minute number 256, Estates and Accommodation Project. Uh, Councillor Mellor, please. Chair, thank you. I'll just point out, I believe you've got a hand showing from, from Councillor Butt. I'm not sure if that's relating to the previous item or or this item. Councillor Judy Butt. Would you like me to continue, Chair, or would you like to... Um... If, if you'd be kind enough just to, to wait one, one moment, please. Uh, and, of course, Chair, yeah, thank I'll you. just check with Councillor Butt. Councillor Councillor Butt, you, you've raised yes, your hand. Yes, thank you, Council, uh, Mr Chairman. I think you, you, you missed me. Um, it's very kind of you. Um, it was just to say two things. Uh, the last speaker, um, uh, we didn't have a clock up for him, um, but his spe speech was uh, rather lengthy. So just to remind you that nobody had, uh, uh, there are three people in this meeting here today meeting and none of us had a clock showing. So I don't quite know what went wrong there. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. But um, Chief Executive, did you wish to speak? Thank you, Chairman. Just, just to show that actually the clock was visible on my screen. I think it's visible on some, and the speech was less than three minutes. Uh, so, just want to make that clear. We are, we are monitoring all speeches. We are timing all speeches. Uh, not only the clock. We also have uh, um, stop what is available. Thank you, Mr. Farrant. Councillor Miller, uh, item. Item 6H. Uh, you're on mute, Cantor Mellor. Not, not for the first time this week, Chair. Um, OK, thank, thank you very much. And uh, look, yeah, this is a really, really important paper as we move to do some of the things I talked about in, in the, the last item in terms of delivering that transformation programme. Um, again, this has been through uh, overview and scrutiny, was, was tested at length there and, uh, and, and Cabinet. So I'll leave my introduction um, relatively brief. A massive part of this is about reducing the, um, you know, the exposure to our large and inefficient um, uh, office accommodation estate. More importantly, it's about delivering that one council, that single single council identity, which we we're looking to do through transformation. Uh, one one of the things I'll just tease out of this chair, if I may, is there's significant investment going into our three town centre libraries, where we'll be delivering a lot of our customer services from in, in the future. So um, we'll be bringing in our customer services closer, closer to the public through this accommodation review. 
and uh, importantly it decouples the civic piece from the office accommodation strategy. The office accommodation strategy is ready to go so we're going to get on and do that. This proposes to get on and do that. We need to spend some time as a council to consider um, how we want our civic um, estate to, to, to look and I'm also very pleased we're talking about a member working party to do to do some of that work. Uh, Chair, I believe this is a relatively you know, self-explanatory paper, paper. It's really important on our journey and I am very happy to, to move it and look to Councillor Broadhead to second. Thank you, Councillor Mellor. Councillor Philip Broadhead, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Happy to second this uh, recommendation again. Uh, Councillor Mellor has brought out all of the, the pertinent points of the paper, mainly that uh, we will be looking to protect that civic heritage part of the um, accommodation that we have across the uh, the various uh, towns and buildings that we have within the Council. Um, and also uh, really looking forward to, to seeing that extra service provision closer to people, which I think is very, very important to people. So this isn't just a dry strategy about buildings, it's intimately tied into how we deliver services in the very best way to the people of Bournemouth, Christchurch and Paul. Uh, happy to second. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, Councillor Marion Lepoideville, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with this document in many ways, um, but it is clearly, when, when I read the document, it's, it's obviously clearly relating principally or entirely to the previous Bournemouth Town Hall, but the decisions required don't make that clear. And I think we ought to have an inclusion of words, particularly in, in B of the decisions, um, a reference that it is decoupling of the service and civic elements of the estates and accommodation pro project in relation to the former Bournemouth Town Hall, because there's no significant mention of pool in there. Um, which brings me on to my second point. Why isn't there any mention of Poole? Um, as, as Mayor of Poole, I was very much aware of the feelings of uh, councillors and residents about the uh, historic civic centre. And that's why I made a request that our last Charter Trustees meeting, we would have a, an update from the Chief Executive uh, as chief executive rather than clerk of the Charter Trustees on that occasion, I presume. Um, and it's clear that very much the intention is that there should be de decoupling in pool, which I'm very happy about, that the front listed section, the original section of the Civic Centre, should be retained for civic functions and for community use, but that the back be used almost certainly for housing. We've already got an, a great example next door to the Civic Centre of the um, former police station that has been converted very sympathetically for housing. Um, there's no reason why the rear section, the newer section of Pool Civic Centre shouldn't be converted in the same way. But my concern is that in the document, it's talking about prudential borrowing to complete the work at Bournemouth, if the pool section that is going to be the intention is to use for housing was brought into the equation at this point, that would reduce or even obviate the need for prudential borrow borrowing. And I'm wondering why that is not on the cards at this stage. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lepoidevin. Uh, Councillor Diana Butler, please. Councillor Butler. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, as I've mentioned in many meetings um, about the Paul Civic Centre, um, I was a bit worried about the wording on our agenda here, how the Civic Centre isn't mentioned as such in Paul, and the core assumptions um, paper um, keeps referring to um, uh, disposal of civic estates without actually specifying what the civic estates are, uh, which actual buildings. So I think it really needs to be put in writing, maybe even a map with, with lines around it, um, you know, to show exactly what buildings you're talking about. Um, so that really needs to be highlighted. I know we've been promised that um, the old part of the Civic Centre will be, um, Pool Civic Centre will be kept, but I still would like it in writing because um, I, I'm just very worried about this. It, it's all the way through 
the page of the core assumptions in section one, five, six and eight, um, all about disposal. And um, I'd, I'd really like to be reassured on that. Thank you. Councillor Mella, did you wish to address? Should, should, should I just uh, quick questions, Chair, um, both from Marion and, and Diana? Um, I still have Councillor Moore wishing to speak, so would, would you prefer Councillor Moore to uh, address the Council first? Uh, per perfectly happy, Chair, at, at, your, at your discretion. Please um, uh, direct me as you will. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Sandra Moore, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, well, I appreciate that this paper is um, actually about the future use of Bournemouth Town Hall. It's about creating an HQ for our staff and somewhere to hold council meetings. But I also think that the one of the most important changes for our residents, and it's a change which actually needs mentioning and highlighting, is that uh, customer services will transfer to the main libraries in Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole. And then residents won't have to visit Bournemouth Town Hall, but can go to the main library of the town in which they live to make their various transactions. And for my residents in Camford Heath and anywhere in North Poole, this is actually going to be an improvement. But talking about Pool Civic Centre, I will just say that in the former Pool Council, when we wanted to find a new use for the historic Guildhall, which is, after all, a former home of Pool Council and built back in 1761, I think, um, we formed a cross-party working group, we found external funding and we moved in a council um, service to ensure the financial viability and to make the whole thing sustainable. And it worked out very well. And there's absolutely no reason why we can't do it again with Paul Civic Centre. And parts of this building already have legal protection and you really don't have to be a member of one particular political party or indeed any political party to want to preserve and protect attractive historic buildings for the benefit of our residents. And we did it in 2007 with the Guildhall and we can do it again with Paul Civic Centre. Um, and, and lastly, can I welcome the recommendation to set up a, a member working group? And I think that will be a really good idea. And I very much hope that this working group will be cross party, as I'm sure that will be beneficial and make sure all members have some say in creating our new HQ. And can this be clarified, please? Um, will this working group be cross party? Hopefully it will. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Moore. Uh, Councillor Mellow. Did you wish to sum up for us, please? Yeah, yes, please, Chair. Thank, thank you, and thank you for the three speakers. And uh, you know, I wholeheartedly agree with the um, uh, effectively what's what's just been come across from the chamber. Uh, Marion, uh, th this is predominantly about the, uh, the the Bournemouth Town Hall, but it's also about our entire uh, accommodation stock. So it's it's about the Bournemouth Christchurch and Paul um, uh, accommodation project, both civic and and office. So it, they are all relevant. The um, you know the, the council accommodation uh, office accommodation will be in Bournemouth. That's a decision of this council and, and the previous administration as as, as well. So to rightly, as this is decoupling the civic part from the office uh, estate, it's it's right that um, talks a lot about the the Bournemouth town hall. Um, I have we've we've had quite a few of these discussions before in terms of overview and scrutiny and that cabinet when I've confirmed. Uh, that, that we will be, you know, maintaining the, the Paul Civic Centre um, in, as a as a building that will be used in, in you know, by uh, by the community, um, and then any parts of that will be developed. You know, my intention is to retain retain the ownership of those separately. Uh, Marion, you make an interesting point around borrowing. Um, just to clarify, and it's also a point that's relevant to the, the previous paper. Um, we, this administration is going to uh, utilise potential borrowing more so that we're effectively um, reflecting costs um, to, to, the, to the benefit. So if you if you borrow for over 40 years and you use an asset for over 40 years, you can spread the cost of paying for that asset over 40 years, as opposed to um, paying for it, for it up front. So we've got other things we will be doing with, 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 with that income. Um, okay, Diana, Diana, we've had this discussion, you know, uh, several times and I really appreciate your championing of this, um, uh, this heritage asset in, in the Paul Civic Centre. You and I are completely on the same page in it. Um, you, you're well aware that we inherited this paper, I inherited this paper um, and I apologise for um, some of the wording in that. I did remove the word disposal a significant amount of times and I've obviously missed, missed some, but I've confirmed to you on in, in three public forums now 
that your, your, yours and my point is the uh, is, is aspiration is the same on it. Um, and Sandra, yeah, very perfectly appreciate your your, your points and, and agree with you. The uh, of, of course, naturally, um, the the working party will be cross party, and uh, I look forward to getting started. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Miller. I missed uh, the fact that Councillor Vicky Slade uh, raised her hand to speak. Uh, Councillor Vicky Slade, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm grateful for uh, Councillor Mello reminding everybody that he's removed the references to disposal, but it, it has to be repeated that uh, an intention to dispose of the entire building. And he knows that uh, because from day one, there has always been a commitment to maintain uh, at least part of the Civic Centre in Paul. So it, it's really out of order that he keeps continuing with that line of, of, of making people believe that we were going to get rid of the poor civic centre and it's totally wrong um the the issue i just want to raise is that um there's reference in the paper to the aging and environmentally inefficient legacy buildings in paul and christchurch but there's no real commitment anywhere in there to actually improve the environmental um credentials of the town hall bearing in mind it's actually the oldest of the three buildings um, bearing in mind our commitment to net zero by 2030 and in particular his earlier commitment to climate and also the commitment of the portfolio holder in his replies to the public questions around the, 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 the absolute commitment to, to achieving net zero. I just would make a request that future papers when we're talking about buildings don't just talk about the fact that having one less building means that we will have um, less carbon we actually have to proactively improve what we're doing um, and these things aren't going to happen unless we make a commitment to them and there's nothing in the paper that says that we will do everything to improve the sustainability of that building the same is true around the equalities impact assessment which talks about the equalities impact from people working um, from home but it doesn't make any commitment to improve the working environment in the building in terms of disability access, which is horrendous at, at the town hall. Um, and I would just make a request that future papers pay further attention to those issues because people need to see an idea of what that might look like. Um, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Slade. Councillor Mellon. Yeah, thank you, Chair. May, may I sum up again? That that would be uh, that would be useful. Um, yeah, th thank you very much. I, I, I actually disagree um, with Councillor Slade, and I believe this has been borne out in in public session before, um, when uh, Julian Oscarfort, the Director for Transformation, suggested uh, quite clearly that there have been three parts to this transformation journey in relation to the Paul Civic. Um, I believe it was February when when initially um, when when Councillor Slade was planning on spending thirty million pounds of Councillor's uh, tax payers money on the uh, refurbishment of the town hall but that was going to be funded by the disposal of the Paul, Paul Civic um, then it came into I believe it was a June June paper or latter paper in the summer post you know the conservative transformation paper um, uh, when that sum was reduced was reduced from 30 million so then at that point um, there wasn't planned to be fully, fully disposed of the asset and now this administration is coming with this paper and says quite clearly in three public forums now that we will not be disposing of um of of, of that site so, so i clearly disagree and i believe um that's been borne out in in ons uh, before um I've, I've mentioned effectively you know th this was uh council slade's paper um so the fact that there was there's she's not happy with the qualities of the environmental point of, of that then um you, you know it's, it's not something she's moved forward before in any of her papers um of course reducing stock does reduce carbon this isn't the only way we'll be reducing our carbon footprint we will very much look forward to um other ways of, of, of been, um, moving forward our stock what we aren't doing is going to spend 30 million pounds of council taxpayers money on an office accommodation building for for for, for BCP, uh, and you see, in this, we have a budget of just over six million pounds. So, uh, thank you very much, Chair, and I'm uh, glad I've been able to sum up on that paper twice. Thank, thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, I have. Uh, I would now move to the vote. Um, can members wishing to abstain or vote against the motion uh, please show in the taskbar? The 
here we have one which is Councillor Farquhar voting against. Okay, uh, we'll, that will be recorded once again. As a, oh, we have uh, Councillor Lewis Allison also voting against. Councillor Lisa Lewis. I'll just give it a few more seconds, members, just to uh, allow for the uh, time lapse on the internet. OK, and I think we will record that as a, a, a majority vote. Thank you, members. Uh, moving on then to agenda item seven uh, this evening, review of the political balance of the council and the allocation of seats. Uh, can I call upon Councillor Drew Meller uh, to uh, move the recommendation for the report, please? Thank you very much, Chair. I'm very, very happy to, to move this recommendation. Um, why are we looking at a review of the political balance here? A um, few reasons, Chair. Chair, we've got a, a new administration, so it's it's right that we actually consider you know how some of the review and scrutiny work. Um, we've also had two recent resignations from the Poor People Party, which triggers um, a, a change in the political balance. Um, what, one of the things we what's in the paper, what we wanted to do um, was remove. We don't think it's right that the administration should have the majority on the main overview and scrutiny committee. Um, very, we had a request um, uh, directed to me and also, you know, publicly from the Christchurch Independent saying they would like a seat on on main ONS. So this facilitates that, which I'm very pleased to say. Um, I, I think the the rest of it there is is pretty self-explanatory, Chair. Um, I just like to say, in terms of recommendation F, um, it's up to full council to confirm the appointment at uh, outside some outside bodies, and the Dorset and Wiltshire Fire Authority is one of them. So. Um, the recommendation here is that Steve Barron as, um, will take up the unaligned seat on the Dorset and Wilkes Fire Authority, which continues his, his position. Uh, Chair, it's also worth mentioning that there is a uh, proposal for a, an un unaligned member on the Lower Central Gardens Trust Board, but at, as present, we have no, um, no takers for that, so that will be a vacancy unless anybody would like, to, anybody from the unaligned group would like to um, come forward now to, to do that. And um, look for Councillor Broad head to second. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Uh, Councillor Broad, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Happy to, to second once again. Um, a lot of work's been done with a lot of people to try and make sure that most people are, are where they would like to be. Um, and indeed, particularly with the uh, overview and scrutiny board, um, hopefully everyone is happy to, so quite happy to second that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Felicity Rice wishing to speak. Councillor Rice, please. Thank you. Um, yes, it was just to let members of the public know um, my place on the pension fund committee has been removed due to the changes in the political balance. Um, however, I would just like to say that I have really enjoyed my time on it so far um, and have found it absolutely fascinating. Um, it is a three billion pound fund for the pensions of many public sector workers within Dorset. Um, Related to this, my son was recently tasked by his school teacher to watch the recent Sir David Attenborough film, A Life on Planet Earth. So I took the opportunity to join in with this piece of homework. Sir David specifically mentions understanding the influence of pension funds and the part they play in continuing to fund fossil fuel companies. For any members of the public that are listening to this meeting, I would thoroughly recommend a attending the Dorset Pension Fund meetings and finding out everything you want to know about the influence these pensions are having on climate change. Um, Friends of the Earth have informed us that over £100 million are still invested in fossil fuel companies by the Dorset um, Pension Fund and it will be a fascinating journey to move towards funding local renewable energy instead. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor David Brown. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, just following on from what Councillor Rice has just said, actually, I just wanted to follow up with 
um, what she'd said. Um, I, I am concerned about recommendation E in the report about the allocation of seats to outside bodies, particularly the um, Dorset Pension Fund Committee and the proposed change. Um, up until now, it's been Councillor Beasley as a Conservative and Councillor Rice and myself on the Pension Fund Committee. And you know, there's significant training to get up to speed and understanding the importance of managing an uh, investment <coughs> portfolio in excess of three billion pounds and the significance of that and the decisions that need to go with that. Um, and I'm just concerned that although I understand the overall sort of political balance is Im important, but when it comes down to this specific committee, you know, three members and we're looking at it changing to two Conservatives and one Liberal Democrat member, um, with Councillor Rice losing her seat. I just think that's out of kilter with this political balance when the minority administration is taking two out of the three seats on that highly significant committee. Um, and I just, and as Councillor Rice said, you know, her contribution has been highly significant on the, on the Pension Fund Committee and the debates and the questions that have been forced at that committee and by the investment managers as a result of that. And I think it will be much poorer, actually, with her seat being removed. And I also wasn't really pleased with the way it's been done, actually. We, there's a pension fund committee on Thursday morning and training, and the papers were sent out to the anticipated new members of the committee. And Councillor Rice didn't receive the agenda papers, although she is, as of this moment, still a member of the pension fund committee, but she wasn't sent the papers for Thursday's meeting because, you know, because it's anticipated that she'll go. So I'm really not pleased with how that's been managed. Um, and to be frank, I'm going to vote against it on that basis because I'm just not pleased with that with that decision. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Millieurl, please. Councillor Royal. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really pleased to see this paper and in particular that the Christchurch Independent Group will finally have their representation on overview and scrutiny. Um, but I'd also like to put forward an amendment on the recommendations and, and make the paper even better so that the committee seat allocations reflect the proportionality of the council uh, more so than it is at the moment. Um, is it OK to share it in the bar and then have a few minutes to speak on it? Uh, yes, please, Councillor Rule. So um, when BCP Council formed, uh, the leader, Councillor Slade, uh, at the time, she made the decision based on the advice she got and the best practice available to allow the Conservative opposition group a majority on overview and scrutiny, which felt really appropriate considering that the Unity Alliance didn't have an overall control. Um, and of course, over time, an unaligned member was invited to join that board too. But now things have changed. Uh, we have a Conservative administration, but still the Unity Alliance groups have not been afforded the same privilege as was afforded to the Conservative group 18 months ago. Um, and the Local Government and Housing Act of 1989, Section 15, Paragraph 5C, says the number of seats on the ordinary committees of a relevant authority which are allocated to each political group bears the same proportion to the total of all the seats on the ordinary committees of that authority as is borne by the number of members of that group to the membership of the authority. So this means that the number of seats each group is entitled to is what it is and needs to be apportioned as such. But where those seats are is up to us as a council. Uh, so we need to make sure that they are proportional to the overall makeup of the council. That's why I'm asking you to support this amendment. At the moment, the Lib Dems are overrepresented on audit and governance by 14%. This is one of only two anomalies where the variance from the political balance seat proportionality is above 10% across the whole council. And I accept that we will never get the proportionality perfect in line with the makeup of the council, but this is a glaring imbalance which can easily be fixed by a simple swap. And by taking a conservative seat from overview and scrutiny board and allocating it to audit and governance and taking a Lib Dem seat from uh, audit and governance and allocating it to the Conservatives, um, the variance is reduced and no percentage variance across the two committees is then above 10%. So please support the amendment, not only because we need an overview and scrutiny board and audit and governance board uh, committee that are proportional and representative of what our residents voted for, but also so the new Conservative cabinet members can be properly scrutinised by a re-energised board 
with a unity alliance opposition majority. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Earl. Um, right, we have an amendment uh, that has been tabled. Uh, do do we have a second? Um, do we have a seconder for your amendment, Councillor Earl? Um, yes, I'm happy to second, uh, Chairman. I, thank you, um, you Councillor Phipps. Could I? Shall I just say a few words now? Then uh, I, it's not very much, but um, I. I'm happy to second and I'd just like to say that you know the scrutiny committee does exist to scrutinize the administration and you can't have um, effective scrutiny of the administration if that committee is actually you know led by the administration uh, and it's a very very important committee um, I am concerned, as is Councillor Earl, about the proportionality, as explained by her, and therefore I am seconding the amendment because I don't believe at the moment the political balance as set in the paper actually gives the Unity Alliance opposition a majority, a clear majority, on the scrutiny committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Phipps. Uh... Next, I have Councillor and Councillor Stribley, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. I didn't want to speak on this amendment. I put my okay. hand up before. This okay. was... Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stribley. So can I just uh, uh, remind members that we are now uh, debating the amendment that's been proposed by Councillor Millie Earl and seconded by Councillor Margaret Phipps. So uh, if members wish to um, withdraw their um, wish to speak unless they wish to speak to the amendment. OK, so Councillor Philip Broadhead. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you to Councillor Earl for the amendment. I'll, I'll keep my um, my comments brief. Um, as as Councillor Earl pointed out, it's never an ideal situation when you are talking about political balance. Um, and a lot of work, as always, has gone in to try to make sure that the people that want to be in the positions they are, are in the positions they are based on the political balance of the political parties. That has happened. That work has been going on behind the scenes. Uh, and I specifically remember quite a lot of criticism, actually, I believe it perhaps even from Councillor Earl, certainly from others before, about last minute amendments to uh, essentially putting people without consultation uh, on different panels, which is essentially what this amendment is trying to do. The other point I would um, politely make out that the Unity Alliance is not a political party. Uh, you cannot um, call them, um, have uh, reference to the Unity Alliance when you are looking at political balance. The political balance is based on uh, the constituted parties as, as we have in our constitution. That is what we have to look at when we are defining this political balance. And on that basis already, even if you took that into account, um, when we're talking about overview and scrutiny, which I think seems to be Councillor Earl's uh, main concern, the uh, minority concern administration at the moment and with these proposals ahead of us uh, do not have a majority on that overview and scrutiny board there is a majority uh, members and the whole thing aligns up with the the, the political balance of political parties um, so uh, for that reason and because of the extensive work that already has been done to make sure that people are where they want to be i will not be supporting this amendment thank you chairman thank you councillor broadhead uh, councillor mike green please Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, I, I also won't be supporting this uh, this amendment. I very much agree with the points that Councillor Broadhead has made, particularly about the fact that the former Unity Alliance is not a group, and therefore that this does not um, apply as far as proportional as far as uh, um, uh, proportional representation on the, each of the individual committees is concerned. But I think I'd go a little bit further. I'm very confused by the. Um, suggestion that representation would be more proportional under the proposal from this amendment. Because when it comes to the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, the Overview and Scrutiny uh, Board, um, the actual Conservative uh, um, allowance under the, uh, under the calculations is 7.3, between 7, 7 and 8 members. So by taking 7 members, the Conservative group is actually already underrepresented on the Overview and Scrutiny Board. 
Um, similarly, if one were to go up uh, to in the, the Conservative group would be considerably overrepresented. And I think this seems much, much more. proportionality, which is what we are obliged to um, fit in with under the Local Government Act. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. We lost you there for a, a, a moment, but I think uh, members got the gist of your uh, of your point. Uh, Councillor Mike Brook, please. Fine, thank you, Chair. Just to pick up on a point that's been made with regard to the difficulties of um, balance, balancing the, the the political groups on committees. Um, actually, it, it's relatively easy because there's a different way of doing it. And that is to ensure that every single committee is proportionately balanced correctly. And therefore, to do that, you actually have to be a little bit more flexible on the size of each of the committees. And what we found with um, this situation is that there's no flexibility whatsoever in the committee size. And therefore, it's making quite a rod uh, for the back of those who are trying to do it. And you'll never get um, anywhere near the level of um, balance that one could achieve by doing it the other way, which is the way we did it in pool before, and it worked ex exceptionally well to have every committee correctly balanced. But I agree with uh, Councillor Earl on this one, that there ought to be a very clear um, distinction in terms of the political balance and that the opposition members should have a full uh, majority on there. Uh, and that certainly isn't clearly the case the moment of the main proposal. So I'm more than happy to support the amendment. Thank you, Councillor Brook. Uh, so, was that Councillor Mellon, uh, Chair? Yes, sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you, sorry, I, I didn't hear that. Um, yeah, re really briefly, thank everybody for, for the comments. I, I think the, the, council, um, uh, the last Councillor speaker has just sort of illustrated why this isn't the right time to be doing this. Um, we've, we've basically had two proposals from the Lib Dems um, you know, because we've, you know, we've had Councillor Earl's uh, amendment and then um, the previous speaker um, wishing to, you know, look at another way of doing this. Let's not make these amendments on hoof. This is very complicated. Um, the, the legislation says that it isn't just a purely numeric decision. This is about, you know, wider, more nuanced factors than that. And it's ultimately the decision of full council. So let full council, uh, let's full council make, make that decision. Uh, yeah, I just got to be really, really clear. You know, there, there are seven Conservatives on a, so there are, so there are eight members who aren't in the administration. So there's a majority outside of the administration on the main ONS board. Um, you know, we've just in this paper taken off our majority on the main ONS board. So to, to be honest with you, I find, I find it, you know, slightly risable, um, you know, where, where we've gotten to on here. Um, and, you know, yeah, fine. You know, other points have been made. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Councillor Manor. Uh, if, if members would just bear with me for one moment, please. I just want to uh, uh, discuss something with uh, officers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, make sure that the, the how the proposal stood or the amendment stood uh, with the political balance, and I'm assured that it is a, in fact a variance to uh, what is on the on the table. Uh, so therefore, um, I think in this instance uh, we will go to a roll call uh, for the vote, and we are voting on the amendment as put forward by Councillor Earl and seconded uh, by uh, Councillor Margaret Phipps. Uh, yeah, Councillor Earl, please. Yeah, I just wanted to see if I had a minute to sum up or- Yes, of course. Straight up, please. Thank you. So um, thank you to all the members for considering the amendment. Um, I want to assure you that the numbers really don't lie on this one. Um, and I
actually, I, I disagree with Councillor Green, Councillor Broadhead, Councillor Mellor. The political balance is what it is by law. You know, it's a calculation uh, that anyone can do on their spreadsheet. Um, it is the proportionality that's the issue. And it's more, it, it is more proportional as in having less variance from zero to accept the amendment. You've and obviously got your share... video on. Hello? <laughs> so uh. I'd be very happy to share that. Um, the amendment will ensure that the allocation of seats is more proportional um, than the paper suggests. And if you respect the rules of proportionality based on who our voters elected, then you have no reason to, su to not support the amendment as put. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Earl. I will now move over to uh, the Chief Executive to conduct the, uh, the vote. Chief Executive, please. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, councillors, you're being asked to vote on the amendment. Uh, if you are in favour of the amendment, could I ask that you vote for? If you are against, uh, could I ask you to vote against? Uh, if you wish to abstain, I'll clearly say that as well. Okay, so Councillor Hazel Allen. Sorry, Councillor Hazel Allen. So I can't hear a response, Councillor Allen. Sorry, Chairman, may I speak? Uh, I I don't know it's important. I'm not sure where Councillor Allen lives, but it does appear that parts of Charminster has now had a power cut, so it may well be that she's been cut off. OK, I'll just try one more time. Councillor Allen, are you on the line at all? Against. Councillor Allen is against on the uh, uh, on the chat, Council. OK. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Lewis Allison. For. Councillor Mark Anderson. Against. Councillor Sarah Anderson. Against. Marcus Andrews. Uh, for. Thank you, Julie Bagwell. Against. Steve Barron. Against. No. Steve Bartlett. Abstain. John Beasley. Against. Derek Borthwick. Against. Philip Broadhead. Against. Mike Brook. For. Nigel Brooks. Abstain. David Brown. For. Simon Bull. For. Richard Burton. For. Diana Butler. Against. Daniel Butt. So, could you repeat, Councillor Butt? Against. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Judy Butt? Against. Eddie Coop? Against. Please. Mike Cox? For. Malcolm Davies? Against. Norman Decent? Against. Leslie Devlin? Four. Brian Dion. Against. Bobby Dove. <laughs> Against. See Lawrence's face. Uh, uh, sorry, Chief Executive. Members, if you're not speaking, can you please mute your microphone? It's causing um, a, a lot of a, a lot of interference with the vote. Uh, sorry, Chief Executive. Thank you, Chairman. No problem. Uh, Casa Beverly Dunlop. Against. Millie Earl. Uh, Jackie Edwards. Councillor Jackie Edwards. She has sent her apologies, Chief Executive. Quite right. Do apologise. Uh, LJ Evans. Four. George Farquhar. Four. Dwayne Farr. Against. Lawrence Fear. Against. Anne Filer. Against. David Flagg. For. Nick Geary. For. Mike Green. Against. Nicola Green. Against. Andy Hadley. 
Paul. May Haynes. Peter Hall. So, Councillor Peter Hall. Sorry, Councillor Peter Hall. Sorry, Councillor Hall, I can't hear a response. Can you try once more? So I've got a, a vote on the chat part, oh, that's fine, thank you. Uh, Councillor Nigel Hedges. Against. Paul Hilliard. For. Mark Howell. For. Mohan Ainger. Against. Joel Johnson. Against. Toby Johnson. For. Andy Jones. Against. Jane Kelly. Against. David Kelsey. Against. Bob Lawton. Against. Marin LePedvin. For. Lisa Lewis. For. Rachel Maidment. For. Chris Matthews. For. Simon McCormack. For. Drew Meller. Against. Peter Ma Pete Miles. For. Sandra Moore. Four. Lisa Northover. Four. Tony O'Neill. Against. Susan Phillips. Councillor Susan Phillips. Sorry. Okay. Against. Thank you. Uh, Margaret Phipps. Four. Karen Rampton. Against. Uh, Felicity Rice. Four. Chris Rigby. Four. Mark Robson. Four. Uh, Roberto Rocco. Against. Vicky Slade. Four. Anne Stribley. Against. Tony Trent. Four. Mike White. Against. Lawrence Williams. Against. And Kieran Wilson. For. Thank you, councillors. I'll just confer with Democratic Services and check that result. Thank you. Thank you, members. <clears throat> I've been advised that the uh, amendment is defeated. Uh, can I therefore ask members wishing to speak on the substantive motion? Councillor Stribley, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. I wish to speak in response to the earliest comments and, if you like, the misinformation which was given out firstly by Councillor Rice and to some extent added to by Councillor Brown, pension funds have no effect whatsoever on climate change. They may, however, historically have invested in companies that do and so I guess it's up to pension funds uh, currently and over coming years to reconsider their positions, but they themselves have no effect on uh, climate change whatsoever. And Councillor Brown uh, commented also on the uh, numbers. The previous administration, which I would remind him was also a minority administration, had two out of the three seats on the committee, of which he's now complaining, the current administration will have two out of the three seats. Doesn't seem to be any logic there, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stribley. Uh, Councillor Andy Hadley, please. Councillor Hadley. Yes, two things if I may, Chair. Firstly, um, that was precisely the point uh, that the pension funds and how they invest their money absolutely has an effect on climate change and on any other 
um, area of uh, um, the economy, the planet, or, or people's well-being. Um, pension funds are a really big investor in in all industries, and if they choose to spend their money on uh, renewable um, and rather than uh, um, uh, um, the, the fossil fuel industry, that would make a huge difference to uh, um, those the, the direction of the planet. Um, the other point I'd just like to make is in terms of, of the discussion that the, the leader was talking about in terms of, of the allocation of seats, and particularly for um, poor people and all, um, the allocation to the outside bodies. Um, the, the only one that we are, are now on is, is the Bournemouth Lower Gardens uh, um, Trust, and, and whilst that's uh, um, a, a worthwhile um, thing, it's in the heart of Bournemouth, so for a, a party that represents people in Poole, it is a really odd choice um, and not one that we were consulted on or, or would have gladly made. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. Uh, Councillor Vicky Slade, please. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Um, I just want to draw attention um, to call from The Guardian from uh, just a few months ago, where it was confirmed that Nest, which is the UK's largest pension fund, uh, which is a public corporation of the DWP, um, and I personally have my um, company pension in it, so I suppose I should declare an interest, um, has been the first and largest of the major pension funds to divest completely from fossil fuels and is described by climate change activists as a landmark move for the industry. So I think um, Councillor Stribley uh, should, should be really clear that it has a massive impact on climate. And the second point I wish to make um, relates to the same, the same uh, comments, which was uh, the Unity Alliance administration, uh, as was clarified earlier, is not a single political group and therefore political balance is not based across the administration, but about political groups. Uh, and uh, it, it's fair to say that there was one Liberal Democrat, one Conservative and one of another group. Uh, and that is what we were asking for on the pension fund. Uh, and, and that is that is what um, would be the fairest thing to do. Um, and I absolutely commend the work uh, that Councillor Rice has done on that pension fund. It's about time that all major funds divested from, from fossil fuels. Thank you, Councillor Slade. Councillor Rigby, please. Councillor Chris Rigby. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add my voice as well, actually. Um, Councillor Slade pretty much summed up um, what I was going to say on the pension funds and their impact on... Um, climate change and that um, they do have a massive impact and also um, I was going to mention Nest but to say as well there's a number of local authorities who've actually pledged to divest from all fossil fuel divestment in their pension funds that includes Lambeth, Islington, Newcastle, Merseyside and um, also Conservative-led Shropshire Council as well so this is an issue being tackled by all parties. Thanks Chair. Uh, thank you, members. Members, I understand your passion with regards to um, uh, you know, the, the uh, um, climate um, problem that we have, uh, but we are here to, to, to discuss this evening um, the balance, uh, the political balance. So if we could keep it to that, I would be most grateful. Uh, Councillor Farquhar, please. Thank you, Chair. Um... Bearing in mind your words, I won't add my own comments as regards my views on uh, pension companies and their investment in fossil fuel industries, um, nor will I add my comments as regards my support for those councils that make the decision to diverse their pension funds away from such companies. However, um, what I would like to add is that I will be voting against the substantive. Uh, the reason I'm voting against the substantive because I think it's an extremely shoddy way in which Councillor Rice has been actually treated um, by this new administration. Um, shoddy in the fact that, um, as has been proven, she wasn't sent the uh, appropriate paperwork for a board, which she was uh, still, as of this moment, on, uh, in anticipation that the numbers would be carried um for the uh for the for the paper for the political balance and shoddy in the way that um uh people that are on boards are actually not approached as regards their wishes um prior to um a political uh, balance being put forward um so are we voting against the substantive for the reason of the shoddy treatment of councillor rice thank you councillor farquhar uh councillor brown councillor david brown 
Thank you, Chair, for letting me speak again. I have spoken on this. It's just as a right of reply, as I was named in a comment by another member earlier about um, pension funds not having any impact on climate change. Um, the Dorset Pension Fund absolutely has a direct impact on climate change and, and it, it has the power to have even more. Um, we were briefed just last week about a direct investment by our investment partners, a £40 million investment using Dorset Pension Fund money in an immense development in East Anglia of um, what, green, what, what, green, green, this, of greenhouses to grow salad uh, vegetables, to uh, cut food uh, miles. Councillor Brown, Councillor Brown, Councillor Brown, sorry, could you could you just hold on for a minute? Uh, we have an issue, I think, with the timer. If me members could just bear with me for a moment. Can, can I raise a point of order at your um, uh, chair? Councillor, your point of order, please. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, you've already uh, told us as a, as a council that this is about the political balance, and we haven't heard anything about the political balance in, in Councillor Brown's second um, discussion with, with us today. So I'd say I'd, I'd call his response, you know, out of order. Uh, Councillor Brown, you, you did say that uh, you were speaking twice, but I, my understanding is you spoke on the amendment before, so so you do have a, a, a right to speak. But uh, I would very much appreciate if members could stick to the motion that is on the table. We're not discussing uh, the, the Dorset Pension Fund. We are discussing the political balance on the BCP Council. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Tony Trent, please. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Uh, Councillor Mike Green. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, What's actually, when Councillor when Councillor Brown spoke, he referred to being able to speak through his right of reply. Uh, can I just confirm with you, as a as a point of order, Mr. Chairman, that um, under the Constitution in um, Part Four, Appendix Three, Fourteen, actually the um, ability to be able to raise a point of personal explanation only applies when they consider that, um, uh, sorry, that it has to be confined to some material part of a former speech by that person, which may appear to have been misunderstood in the current debate. Could I ask you please to confirm that, Mr Chairman, and to remind both Councillor Brown and all other members that that is what uh, a personal, a point of personal explanation involves. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. 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 If you just bear, just bear with, with, me. with me one moment. One moment. Thank you, members. Yes, I can confirm that you are correct, uh, Councillor Green, and that. Uh, Councillor Brown does not have a right, a right of reply. I think the confusion may have been there that we had an amendment on the table and Councillor Brown spoke on the amendment, um, not wishing to put any words in anybody's uh, mouth at all, but that was my understanding of it. Can we move on then please to uh, Councillor Tony Trent? Thank you Chair. Um, I'm quite quite confused by what's behind a lot of this discussion. I can understand that political balance changes. I've been um, the victim of changes twice this year, even before the change of administration, um, where, where numbers change. So, um, you know, it is necessary to tweak it from time to time. But the representation on outside bodies, I'm, I'm getting rather confused by this because this is normally done at annual council and some of these outside bodies, the representation is of a certain position, so transport or set on something or whatever, or portfolio holder for transport. And I can understand that, but ordinary members have been swapped around on various outside bodies at someone's whim, whether it's to kind of satisfy, you know, what someone has 
done or something, you know, some 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 kind of discrete reward. But actually, none of these other positions that aren't tied to a position on the council should be being changed ahead of annual council, which is next May or June or whenever it happens. So there is that there's some I think is very seedy and very uncomfortable going going in the background. I think the police Fiscal balance change is one thing, but there's other stuff going on in the background. And um, Councillor Rice, um, her, her, her situation is one of these things. And you do not change positions like that in the middle of the year. That is not the way that things have been done in years gone by. So I really think that needs to be looked at seriously. And, um, you, you know, we shouldn't have seedy backroom deals. It should all be open and we should be working to a system and not you know making it up as we go along which seems to be what's happening since first of october uh, thank you uh councillor Tre for the points that you make uh, uh members i'm just going to seek uh guidance on on this point uh we, we are a new council uh and i think it's uh, wrong to refer to the previous councils uh I, if members would just bear with me I'll, i'm going to seek guidance I'm going to invite um, the monitoring officer, Susan Zeiss, to... Uh, uh, to outside bodies, particularly these that need to be politically balanced, are at the leader's discretion, and the leader may uh, change those memberships uh, at his discretion when he wants to, according to our BCP constitution. Thank, Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Uh, do I have any further speakers, please? Uh, Councillor Nicola Green. Thank you, Chairman. I had absolutely no intention of speaking in this debate. Um, I can understand, although I don't agree with um, Councillor Earle's approach in, um, in bringing the amendment. It was at least debated um, intelligently and uh, with understanding by members. But for us to have got to the point where a member refers to CD backroom deals taking place and the fact that they don't understand what is in the papers is frankly a, a rather appalling indictment of where we've got to um, in this meeting. It is incumbent upon members to make the effort to understand the papers which are in front of us. Um, the reason that we're doing this in full council is precisely because it requires transparency. It should be done in an open forum, but it should be done by members who really have taken the trouble to do the work, make the effort and understand what it is that they're voting on. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Lawrence Fear, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to echo some of the points Councillor Nic Nicola Green's just said um, in regards to the papers. This is nothing new. Um, this happens in all authorities. This is usual practice of when change, changing administration happens. Um, so I, I just think that saying uh, any CD backroom deals, I think um, it just shows a lack of understanding of what we are about to vote on. And uh, I hope we can go to the vote now, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you, councillors. Indeed, I will move to the vote, and I think on this occasion I will uh, hand over to the Chief Executive to conduct uh, the vote. Chief Executive, please. Thank you, Chairman. So, uh, councillors, 
you're being asked to, to vote on the uh, a paper as presented. Uh, if you please either vote for or against or abstain. Uh, and for brevity, I just thought I'd make it clear that I, I would try to use the name rather than the term councillor for each individual to save me repeating the word 74 times and uh, that taking rather longer if that's okay with you. Uh, so Hazel Allen. For. Lewis Allison. Against. Mark Anderson. For. Sarah Anderson. For. For. Thank you. Marcus Andrews. Against. Judy Bagwell. For. Steve Barron. For. Stephen Bartlett. For. John Beasley. For. Derek Borthwick. For. Thank you. Philip Broadhead. For. Mike Brook. Against. Nigel Brooks. For. David Brown. Against. Sorry, uh, Simon Bull. Against. Richard Burton. Against. Diana Butler. For. Daniel Butt. For. Judy Butt. For. Eddie Coop. For. Okay. Mike Cox. Against. Malcolm Davis. For. Norman Decent. For. Leslie, Leslie Dadman. For. Brian Dion. For. Bobby Dove. For. Beverly Dunlop. For. Millie Earl. Against. Jackie Edwards. Sorry, not here. LJ Evans. For. Uh, George Farquhar. Uh, Dwayne Farr. For. Lawrence Fear. For. Anne Filer. For. David Flagg. For. Nick Geary. Against. Mike Green. For. Nicola Green. For. Andy Hadley. Against. May Haynes. May Haynes. Four. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Peter Hall. So, Councillor Peter Hall. Oh, is it? Yes. Four. Thank you. Uh, Nigel Hedges. Four. Paul Hilliard. For. Mark Howell. Against. Mohan Ayanga. For. Cheryl Johnson. For. Toby Johnson. Against. Andy Jones. For. Jane Kelly. For. David Kelsey. For. Bob Lawson. For. Yeah, Marin Lepedevin. Against. Lisa Lewis. Against. Rachel Maidment. For. Chris Matthews. Against. Simon McCormack. For. Drew Meller. For. Pete Miles. Against. Sandra Moore. Against. Lisa Northover. Against. Tony O'Neill. For. Susan Phillips. For. Margaret Phipps. Against. Uh, Karen Rampton. For. Okay, uh, Felicity Rice. Abstain. Uh, Chris Rigby. Against. Mark Robson. Against. Roberto Rocco. For. Vicky Slade. Against. Anne Stribley. For. Tony Trent. Against. Mike White. For. Lawrence Williams. For. And Kieran Wilson. Against. Thank you. That's.
Mr Chairman, may I ask a question? Sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, that motion is carried. Uh, members will note at F that the council is requested to approve the appointment of underlying members to the relevant outside bodies. Uh, we still have uh, one one vacancy. Uh, can I ask is, if there's any uh, underlying members wish to take that position up uh, this evening? If not, it will remain uh, uh, unfilled. Uh, Councillor Councillor Vicky Slade. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I please make a request that when we are doing the votes that people actually put their videos on? Um, because um, I think the public have a right to actually see us where we are on a full call and not on a telephone line, uh, that we are actually voting and are present. Uh, the long delays before somebody actually voting uh, may give some the impression that we're not all sat listening to our every word and I think we should be making it clear that we are sat watching and listening. Uh, thank, thank you for your point, uh, Councillor Slade. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm going to uh, break for 10 minutes. Um, so can we reconvene at uh, half past nine? Thank you, members.
Welcome back, members. Uh, before I move on to agenda uh, item eight, I noted in, noted in the uh, the chat bar that uh, Councillor uh, Stephen Bartlett very kindly uh, volunteered to go for the um, uh, uh, outside body for um, was it the gardens, lower gardens. Um, so. Uh, Part and parcel of item seven was that uh, we had confirmed the appointment. So if if members are happy, um, I will accept in the chat bar um, any abstentions or uh, against votes. Uh, but I'm sure that um, members will be happy for Councillor Bartlett to take up that post. Thank you very much, members. Uh, agenda item eight on uh, this evening's agenda. Uh, I'd like to firstly hand over to the chief executive, uh, Mr. Farron. Thank you, Chairman. Just to advise members that in preparing the report, uh, the figures that we've used for the members allowances, councillors allowances, are the figures that you are currently getting paid. Uh, those allowances we have agreed would be uplifted uh, from the 1st of April by the National Pay Award. That has not yet been put into payment, for which we, we apologise. That will come through during December. Uh, but it does mean that the figures in the report, when you look at the, the actual allowances that should be being paid at the moment, should all be 2.75% uh, uplifted. So to give you an example, the 12,500 uh, basic allowance becomes 12,844 as the base point. The cabinet members allowance, which is listed at 20,000, uh, is actually 20,550 uh, with that 2.75% added. So uh, apologies for the confusion. As I say, the figures in the report show uh, the figures we're actually paying, paying now, uh, but there is a pay uh, award that goes through. That was agreed through the medium term financial plan in February 2020 and will come into payment in December. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Farron. Uh, members, I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. John Quinton, who is the uh, chairman of the Independent Remuneration Panel, uh, to present this evening's report. Uh, Mr. Quinton, please, and welcome. Good evening, Good evening Chairman. Welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you for allowing me to address yourself and uh, your fellow councillors. And I may, if, um, if I can, uh, highlight a couple of issues within the report that I think supports the panel's recommendations and findings. Um, as councillors will know, uh, the panel has already considered the allowances scheme for the, the council, both in the interim period, i.e. April to May 19, and for the new council um, from the 6th of May. But at that time, it was recognised that a further review should be undertaken uh, to consider the ongoing emerging governance structure. So in December 2019, the then leader requested a further review, and that review is set out in your Appendix 1, tonight. So within that, within port, um, the panel took evidence from members of the council, both by, through the issue of a questionnaire, but also through interviews with specific members. And the key findings were that the responses suggested that there was an increase in workload of members, and that set out in paragraph 8.4 of the report, but also that the benchmarking data for the southwest and the southeast indicated that the basic allowance might be on the slightly low side. So based on that, based on the challenges and the workload um, for BCP councillors, the panel felt that the basic allowance should be increased. So that was probably the, the key finding from a, a Appendix 1, Chairman. Um, also, I'd like to point out, I've been asked to point out that in paragraph 13 one C of the report, where we talk about co-opted members on the school admissions panel, that has been dealt with under separate regulations, and so therefore should be deleted, with the consent of council, should be deleted from the scheme of alliances. If, if I could move briefly on to Appendix 2, that deals with the uh, appointment of, six lead, of the six lead members, and again, that was requested by the leader of the council. We interview group leaders, uh, um, a cabinet member and a lead member. And again, the key findings are set out in paragraph five of the report. We did, the panel did have some concerns about the reporting arrangements, um, 
proposed and also how uh, that accountability would work and how success would be measured. And on that basis, the panel recommended a basic uh, uh, an SRA of £5,000. The recommendations are set out in the officer's covering report. Uh, and if you wish, Chairman, I will try and respond to any questions that members have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Quinton. And uh, would you pass on uh, my thanks to uh, your panel for the excellent work that they've undertaken? Um, and I would now like to call on uh, the leader, please, to uh, to respond. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. And, and Chair, I um, uh, also pass on my, my thanks to John. John, uh, thank you for, to you and your team for, for the work done on, on both of these papers. And I'm glad we've been able to bring bring both of them um, uh, together and separately in their own right. Uh, Chair, Chair, if I may, in, in moving this paper, I'd like to um, suggest an amendment, uh, if I may. And it'd probably be easier. The advice I've had from Democratic, it was if I share my screen. So uh, with your permission, Chair, I'll, I'll share my, my screen to put the amendment on screen. Uh, please do, Leader. I'm not looking able to share the the screen I've got um, at the moment, and I can't share the, a Word document, Chair. So unless um, Richard from Democratic would like to share the, the, the screen of a document that I've sent him, um, it might be uh, difficult. Are you able to help um, Richard at all? Or does, does, is that oh. working? Effectively, fine. Oh, it looks like we've. Uh... OK, is that, is that OK, Chair? Is, is that from you, Ca uh, Councillor Mellor, or is that from Richard? That's from me, me Chair. Was, um, oh, super, super. Grappling, thank you. Grappling with the technology. Um, OK, Chair, thank, thank you very much. And again, just to repeat the thanks to the, the, uh, the, the panel. Um, there, there's quite a lot of detail in this. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll share some basic principles. Um, and then I'll move the uh, move, move the recommendation. So um, we thank the committee for, for their report, but we don't believe, I, I certainly don't believe this is the environment to be uh, taking a, a thousand pound um, uh, pay award um, or, or any further discretionary pay awards. So we're proposing that there's no increase in the basic allowance for, for the 21-22. Proposing if we link to the um, local government for 22-23, there's a full pay freeze for the ensuing year. I think that's a really important point, Chair, because this always comes to us and all my time as a uh, member. Um, this is a very, you know, quite rightly, I don't believe of our own pay so by setting a level and then using but as part of my commitment my personal commitment that the leader will forego Rate in full for the length of this term, 23. Um, the members will have a reduction of two. Um, we propose a to leave members at 10,000. I'll just pause on that point, Chair. And the, the rationale for the proposal is five thousand pounds. I'm on record more, 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 more uh, uh, onerous role. I'm I'm convinced that the is is relevant, and um, you know I'll take down these roles and. And we'll see. The last thing we're proposing is that the uh, increase. Sir, in the Sir Councillor Mellor, um, yeah. that's uh, from, Fine. what I was going 
I'm going to ask is, could you uh, share with us the, the uh, revised recommendation, please? Uh, I can't quite see it on my screen. Uh, it's effective. That, that's what I'm well, Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, so all of the has been, um, uh, you know, put in, in uh, above effectively. This, this is the detail. I just want to make sure people have sighted the, the bottom of the, the, uh, the, the the bottom of the screen. The particular point to, to note is around the Chairman of the Licensing Committee um, as being the only other material change to, to, to what's recommended. We believe that should be on a par with the other regulatory chair, the, the, the planning chair. Um, uh, and there's no other changes in the uh, in, in the recommendations uh, from, from what's in, in the report. So, so chair, all of the changes in the recommendations are around the, the leader um, reducing in full the, their SRA, um, all cabinet members reducing 2K, lead members coming in at the same level as the scrutiny chairs um, and the chairman of the council, no change to the vice chairman of the council, no change to audit and government, and no change to planning committee, no change to overview and scrutiny board. Um, agreeing with the IRP regarding reduction in children's and health ONS. Um, and then there's a change in the uh, licensing committee chair and vice chair. Uh, no other changes, chair, and I apologise for overrunning so significantly. Uh, do, do you have a seconder? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that, Councillor Mellor. Did you have a seconder? Yeah, look to Councillor Broadhead uh, to, to second this, this amendment and I'll stop sharing my uh, screen share. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, did you wish to speak, Councillor Broadhead? Thank you, Chairman. Happy to second the amendment and I'll reserve my right to speak later in the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a few members wishing to speak. Uh, Councillor LJ Evans, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, thank you to Mr Quentin for your uh, report. Obviously, the whole point of having the independent review panel make their suggestions is that we all have a declaration of interest when it comes to deciding our allowances. So I really don't understand why we're debating this in the first place. I think it should just be agreed. Um, as written. Secondly, I'm, I'm quite surprised by this amendment. Um, I may be a fairly new councillor, but uh, for the leader to amend his own paper seems rather unusual. Um, as someone's put in the chat, I really don't understand how we can possibly discuss and debate this amount of detail at this um, period in time. Um, so I would suggest that it is uh, deferred. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Evans. Um, I, are you proposing that, that, that this item be deferred? Do you have a seconder? Yes, Chairman, I'd be happy to second that. And Stribley. Thank you, Councillor Stribley. Uh, at, at, at this point, um, I think I'd move to the, the amendment that's uh, been proposed that it be deferred. Members, if, just bear with me, I'm taking uh, legal advice. Members, having taken advice, uh, my understanding is that uh, it's only the leader who can defer this item. So um, can I ask uh, the leader, are you willing to defer this item from this evening's agenda? Councillor Mellor, please. Uh, th thank you, Chair. And, and 
And now I'm not, you know, this paper, the original paper was just deferred from a significant amount of time ago. And uh, I believe we need to uh, need to move move forward on it. I did uh, contact the, the leader of the opposition, Miliel, um, to discuss whether that we wanted to have a cross party conversation about this this paper. That that I didn't have a response. So just move forward in, in, in this vein, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mellor. Uh, Councillor Farquhar, please. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. My question is actually for, um, um, sorry, John Q. I've, I, I, I missed your pronunciation of your surname. Um, to my understanding, you chair the IRP, and the IRP have made the recommendations, particularly on um, the basic allowance, twice now. Um, on the first, uh, on the first paper, which was called, if I recall correctly, in December 2019 by the then leader. Um, and then once again, it was reinforced that the panel's view was that uh, all members should increase their basic allowance for you know uh, the, the the reasons which you've given in the paper itself. Uh, my question to you really is, what's your view on an amendment which essentially throws out the work of the panel in disregarding on this particular item, yeah, of the basic allowances, um, and just just tears it up your recommendations and says I'm going to go my own way. Uh, with an, uh, an amendment which is launched literally at the last minute quite um, it has taken some degree of writing to put it together but is launched on the uh, full council to debate fully and to understand its implications but my question to you is how do you feel about the nature of the IRP's recommendations for basic allowances to be increased um, just being thrown out um, on a whim Chair, would you like me to respond to that? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the IRP, you know, is 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 lives in an ideal world, you know, on that basis because it can prepare recommendations on the evidence that it's received. But actually, the council lives in the real world, and and they we've got no budget responsibility at all, the IRP. So, but the council does. So we've got no remit in that area. So, to some degree. Every single recommendation we must we make must be viewed in the context of the the real world circumstances of the of the council. Thank you, Mr. Quentin. Before I move on, uh, Councillor Mellor, would it be possible, please, to email all the members with a copy of the uh, recommendation that you're proposing? Yeah, yes, Chair, I'll, I'll do that now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lee, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Chairman, it's very rarely I break the traces on an issue, but I'm afraid on this one, um, I'm rather inclined to go with the recommendations of the IRP. The uh, they've looked at everything very carefully. Certainly, as far as I'm concerned, basic members' workloads have increased considerably over this year since lockdown. Uh, we may not attend physically so many meetings, but in fact, I spend much more time than I ever had to before on uh, communicating with residents and dealing with things on emails and so on. And I find my workload has considerably increased. Um, we are looking at the uh, cabinet members looking to take a reduction. Um, that's fine, but of course no member actually has to take an allowance if they think it's too much or inappropriate. Um, and I've known in the past members who've declined to take any allowance at all. I have concerns about the uh, increase, considerable increase in the uh, SRA for the licensing committee, because having sat on both licensing and planning committees for many years, the workload of the licensing committee has no resemblance whatsoever to the workload of and I don't see the 
justification, certainly at this time, for equalising them. There may be, of course, case for some adjustment, um, but it wasn't picked up by the independent panel, and I haven't seen an argument made for it. Also, the roles of um, lead members are new roles, and I think the uh, recommendation of the panel is quite generous. In effect, it's about 40% of a basic allowance, so it is a considerable increase on the basic allowance. Upping that to 10,000 for six members, that's £30,000 extra on the bill when we are looking hard keeping our budgets down. Um, and I think we, we've only had lead members basically for a few weeks, uh, not even for a year, that I think that should run on the, again, on the um, independent panel recommendation and then to be reassessed when we see the value and the workload that has been put in by each of the members. So I'm afraid on this occasion, I can't That's support uh, the... Three, three, minutes. three minutes. Thank, Thank you, you Chairman. Chairman. I've made Thank my points. Much. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I'm in violent agreement with my colleague, Councillor Stribley, and also uh, uh, Councillor Evans, uh, other than the deferment suggestion that she made. You know, here we have uh, an independent remuneration panel. I've done a lot of work with, with experts and uh, we should listen to them. To have thrown at us at the very last minute, the whole uh, raft of uh, changes, which effectively puts the independent review body's uh, uh, paper in the dustbin, I think is, 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 is absurd. Uh, it, it would take a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, further consideration of the extent of these these changes. Uh, I don't think we should be doing that uh, off the hoof at the last minute like this. I think uh, we should take the expert views as recommended by the independent uh, uh, review board now uh, and uh, accept the recommendations as given. I won't be supporting the amendment. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Miliero, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got some really serious concerns about this. I mean, the leader said in an email to, email to me that he hadn't seen this paper before it was published. Now, you know, I think that's really unprofessional that a leader of the council can actually submit a paper to council without actually having read it himself. And then to bring this with all these amendments today without giving us either in our groups or in, you know, any councillors, um, across the board an opportunity to consider it. Um, I think that's quite telling of maybe the leadership that we're going to see. Uh, it's even more telling to me that a member of their own party is willing to second such a deferral and perhaps maybe he should listen to her um, as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Councillor David Kelsey. Uh, Councillor Kelsey, please. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. A um, couple of points, if I may. Firstly, regarding the increase in the fee for licensing, licensing meets far more often now than planning board does. And having served on the licensing board yourself as a very good chairman, chairman, you will know the frequency of the meetings now and the work that we have to undertake because every meeting is a subcommittee. So therefore, in my opinion, the increased fee for the licensing chairman is a, a good move. On the point of recommendations, chairman, Every single paper that we as councillors get, either to Cabinet, Planning Board, Licensing, ONS, whatever it may be, has recommendations on it. It does not mean to say that we have to accept those recommendations. We are fully within our rights as councillors to make a decision not to go with those recommendations and to go with others. That's all I'd like to say, Chairman, and I will be supporting the amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kelsey. Councillor Vicky Slade, please. Thank you, um, Chair. I'm absolutely shocked to see this this paper come forward. Um, I completely agree with with Councillor Stribley and, and Councillor Bartlett. Um, I was um, expecting to see what um, the leader said in his report to us when he became leader, that he was planning to fund the allowances of the um, 
of the lead members from the cabinet uh i've got a couple of severe issues about how somebody can claim to lead a council of this size um for an income which is below the minimum wage if you look at the number of hours that a leader should be putting into the job um i'm also very confused about how it, he can be very keen to to pay the higher amount because Dorset pays the higher amount to lead members when Dorset pays 35,000 I believe to its leader as do most of the other unitaries so either we go with what Dorset does or we don't it feels like picking and choosing the bits for me I think we either go with what the independent review panel um, suggests or or we don't make any changes um, until next year. I originally asked for this to be deferred because I didn't think it was appropriate to talk about members' uh, allowances changing at all during a pandemic. Um, and I'm, I'm just appalled to see this. There's absolutely no question of supporting this. And I, I hope the leader will decide to withdraw it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Slade. Councillor Wilson, please. Um, thank, th thank you, Chair. Um, I, I wasn't intending to speak on this. Um, ha however, I, I think um, the way that this has been brought about uh, is quite, well, it's, just, it's just really not appropriate. I remember um, previously, um, Councillor Howe um, had left off a risk, risk register from a development and he got absolutely ridiculed for that. To bring something like this so late, for us to have it emailed to us, not have a chance to really digest it, really take it in. I, I don't know. It's just really difficult to take. Um, and I, I just like to ask, like, how much? And excuse my ignorance if if um, it is written somewhere and I haven't read it. Um, but how much actually um, it, it cost us to have the independent um, report panel um, commissioned? Because you know, I think I think that's also a, a burden to the taxpayer. That's you know, if we're just going to not acknowledge or accept their findings, what was the point in commissioning that work? Thank you, Councillor Wilson. Uh, Councillor Rigby, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was going to say very similar things to what Councillor Wilson's just said, actually. Um, having this amendment thrown at us on the night is incredibly disappointing. Um, we obviously get these papers two weeks before, and we have a lot of papers to read as councillors and we take everything on board and we digest it this is the leader's paper and then he submits an amendment during the presentation of the paper which completely changes what the paper actually is why we couldn't have had eyes on this even a few days earlier or a little bit sooner to just come out with this and expect us to be able to digest changes, work out what the effect on the budget is going to be, work out um, how this is going to affect all the other councillors, um, what it's going to be received as, everything like that. I really don't think that we can be looking at this at 10 o'clock at night, sort of three hours into a meeting and expect to have reach a reasonable decision on this. I'm outraged by it, to be honest with you, and I can't support it at all. Thank you, Councillor Rigby. Councillor Jude's butt, please. Councillor Butt. My apologies, Mr Chairman. I indicated inadvertently. Um, um, I'll demur. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Lawrence Fear. Thank you, Chair. I also wasn't going to speak on this, but um, I feel after some previous members have spoken, I, I'm out of this. Um, I feel that the, the amendment has come um, in uh, proper order. Um, yes, the papers, we do have a lot of papers to read um, and amendments are put, put forward to council at the appropriate time. Um, I feel that at this time as well, when we're in the middle of, of, uh, of this pandemic, um, it is right that we don't um, look to increase our allowances at this time. I have been more busy, uh, this has been the most busiest period um, since I was first elected back in 2015. Um, so I understand where Councillor Dribbley is coming from and others said that it's a busy time. But I do not feel that it's the right time to increase our allowances when there are so many other people out there that are struggling that um, that, that would not see this as a right and proper way. I just, I just don't think this is the right time to do that. Next year, um, obviously, we will look at 
this um, and also in the amendment with the National Salary Award. Um, I think that's a good way of linking it, taking it out of councillor's hands um, and giving it a solid framework. Um, so I will be supporting the amendment. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fear. Uh, councillor Leslie Deadman, please. Councillor Deadman. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to echo what some councillors have said about this is the wrong time to do this. Not only is it the wrong time to um, put this a rather um, complicated amendment to the original paper, um, the amendment made by the same person that generated the paper, but it's also the wrong time to be thinking about any of this. And um, so I shan't be supporting it. And as I say, I think it's totally out of order at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dedman. Uh, Councillor Maidman, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, the leader himself said that this paper um, had been deferred from, uh, from February. Therefore, he's had over nine months to consider this. And I just find it entirely incompetent that we're waiting until this very last minute for him to bring this amendment. Um, and as has been said by many of my colleagues, we've had two weeks to read these papers, digest them and come to conclusions. And now we're expected within five, ten minutes to digest quite wholesale changes. Um, in terms of the paper itself, I've been quite conflicted around it. I do not believe it's the time for us to be looking to make adjustments to pay. However, I also believe that we have an invest a vested interest in this and therefore we shouldn't be the ones making decisions about our own pay. In no other job do I choose what pay I should or shouldn't have. That is the whole purpose of having an independent panel. Um, so yeah, as I say, I'm conflicted about the um, the paper in it itself, but I'm also appalled by the um, behaviour of the leader that he's amended his own paper um, at such a late stage in the game, and it, it just smacks of incompetence to me. Uh, Councillor Mohan Iyengar, please. Yeah, um, thank thank you, Chair. Um, with apologies for being a little bit dour, um, I, I just I'm, I'm taking a very very sort of grim view about the sort of the drama in this discussion about it's not the right time to discuss this and we've had um, too little time. I, I'm sorry, I'm not in that camp whatsoever. And some people say, well, you would say that, wouldn't you, Mohan? No, I'm sorry. Just sometimes, you know, now is the time to move on these things. And how much time do people need to look at these things? Forgive me. Um, first of all, consultants report, OK? Um, I was a management consultant for about 20 years, OK? One appoints consultants to research, look into something and give recommendations. It doesn't mean then you slavishly follow exactly what's been recommended there, OK? And the leader of the council, the leading administration is perfectly entitled, obviously, to respect what's been researched and what's been recommended and then to lead and take their own view about the way forward. And that's how things work with these sort of things. Um, it is the right time to be moving on these things. We've so many things to do. Um, we can't be deferring and deferring these sorts of things. Um, I'll be I'll be I'll be voting in favour of the leader's recommendation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councillor uh, Engar. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask the monitoring uh, officer if she'd be kind enough to just uh, address the council. Uh, Susan, please. Thank you, Chairman. I just thought I would clarify three points that have risen during the debate. Um, first of all, councillors always have to uh, vote on their own remuneration. It's um, It would be a nonsense for the panel to come and, and represent something and for councillors not to vote on it. And the reason they can do in this instance is that the monitoring officer gives a dispensation and that's that's uh, provided for in the law and in the, in the constitution for the monitoring officer to be able to give a dispensation for members to vote on this occasion only. And then um, secondly, this is not the leader's report. It's the report of the monitoring officer and the head of democratic services. And thirdly, another factual thing I'd like to say is that the independent remuneration panel appointment is a requirement of the law. So it's not a, a, a thing that you can decide you want to appoint a consultant or not. The law requires that report to be independent. Thank you, Chair. I just thought I'd clarify those few points. Thank, Thank you very much, uh, Susan, and I hope that helps members. Uh, can I move now on to uh, Councillor Tony Trent, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I just really want to um, quote the, 
the leader was quoted as, as intending to scrap the basic allowance increase and um, reducing his and his cabinet members' rate to compensate for the new roles. Unfortunately, um, just quickly looking at his bit of paper without sitting down and sort of, you know, doing some calculations and stuff like that, it looks like he's proposing 65 plus thousand extra um, allowances being paid out and the reductions that are being um, promised are, are in um, cabinet and leaders, etc., which I, you know, I, I, I admire the fact that he's actually proposed something that does that, but it only com it only amounts to about thirty four thousand pound or thirty four thousand five hundred or thereabouts. That's just round figures. Um, which, if he was proposing that the has got the five thousand pound each that was recommended or agreed after the um, discussion with the um, panel, then that would effectively have worked what, what, what he was promising. But it looks as if, and I don't want to use the word seedy again, but it does feel uncomfortable that so much money is being paid out on ill-defined Ill roles and, um, they would now be getting more than cabinet members, um, which is very strange uh, because they don't actually take responsibility in the same way. Yet at the same time, the other side of the coin is they're only reducing it. So they're covering half the cost of the increases. So I can't really support any of this. As far as I'm concerned, this is not the right time to do it. And, um, you know, the leader had stuck to to what was implied in the newspaper report today, then I might have gone along with it. But, you know, as far as I can see, this is just chucking more, more money at positions that didn't exist previously. Um, the cabinet members did their job and you know, other people would, have, would advise them or give them their opinion for nothing. And it just seems to me that it's just generating um, rewards for people doing whatever they did. Quite, quite frankly, I think the whole thing stinks and we shouldn't be going along with any of it. It should be looked at again or the leader goes to what he was implying was going to be the proposal earlier on. And then I might have you know, gone along with it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Trent. Uh, Councillor Philip Broadhead, please. Yes, um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, and uh, thank you to all of the, the previous speakers that have spoken as well. Thank you in particular to the monitoring officer for her um, uh, points of clarification, some of which I was actually going to make in mine. And, and again, like Councillor Fear had mentioned earlier, I think it would be good to try and take a little bit of the heat out of uh, what has become a very charged argument. Uh, the first point I would make, as, as, as the monitoring officer did point out, uh, there's been a lot of talk about well, why is the leader and, and myself seconding um, this, why are we amending something that has been proposed? Well, it's, it's as the monitoring officer pointed out, this is a paper that is receiving uh, the independent remuneration panel's recommendations. Um, that is the, the, the substantive item. Uh, and then it's what we do with it. And so we have to amend it if we have anything further that we wish to add. Uh, there, there's been a lot of outrage about this. And I think it's not quite the outrage that I thought we were going to have tonight, because I think we need to be very honest with ourselves of what, um, and uh, with great credit to the um, uh, independent remuneration panels work but as the as the, the gentleman earlier on pointed out their job is to work in an idealistic world uh, and not have to bear the consequences of financial con financial consequences of some of their recommendations and the recommendations and it, it says it's very clearly in the report that the full year impact of implementing the core uh, recommendations which many members seem to want to implement would be almost 150,000 pounds extra to the council taxpayer so to be very clear, and a lot of people have talked about this is the wrong time to do this, I completely agree. It is the wrong time to be saddling the council taxpayer with £150,000 extra in the middle of a global pandemic just because we think we deserve an increase in, in allowances. I don't think that time is right. The leader doesn't think the time is right. Um, so I think we need to be very clear again what we are actually proposing with this amendment. The leader has taken a decision, it's his personal decision, it's clear in the amendment that it is for the life of the term, um, for his term, 
to, to forego his additional SRA as a leader. That doesn't bind uh, any successors. That is his personal decision. The cabinet um, will take a 10% um, a, a drop on their allowances and we will forego uh, the increase that's recommended uh, by the independent remuneration panel for the rest of the councillors, precisely because in the current climate, it doesn't feel right for us to be taking on more money. The workload is high. We've got a big job to do. But imagine the headlines if we all voted for ourselves 150 grand uh, collective pay increase tonight. That is what this is about. Uh, the rest of the issues around making sure that the, the different bodies are paid in, the, in in a slightly relevant way for their roles are relatively minor points. The major points are that the executive are taking a substantial pay cut and recommending that there is not a pay increase for all of the councillors in these very difficult times. For that reason, I really think we should be accepting this recommendation. And if you do not accept this amendment, think about the headlines tomorrow because you will be voting for 150 grand extra in council taxpayers money for your pay rise. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Councillor Andy Hadley, please. Thank you. It, it feels like there's a playbook about taking the heat off going on at the moment. Um, I, I, I agree with, with Councillor Stribley. I think there's, there's a, um, a clear, clearly here that there, there's a, a, a number of issues. There are, there are two separate elements. There's something about the basic allowance and there are members for whom actually they're giving up uh, um, uh, paid employment uh, and, and, and not paid massive amounts of money in order to take on their council role and, and the council's role has got busier um, part, uh, through, through lockdown and also uh, members have been working hard through, through lockdown and not, and not, not furloughed as, as, as some people have. People outside, you know, look look on on what we get and think it's a privilege and that we get lots of money and I know the, the hours that, that, that many members are working. Um, there are some significant changes to, to some of the detail around the licensing committee and we heard from a member of the licensing committee that that work has gone up. But there is a new uh, um, allowance for the vice chair of that committee, which which accounts for the fact that the vice chair is sometimes chairing those meetings or the sub subcommittee meetings. Um, the the, the uh, lead members are double what was being advised on um, by the independent review panel without really justification clarity about why um, they should get indeed more than the chairs of of, of health and children's uh, um, uh, um, which have gone down. Um, so there just does seem to be a, um, a, a range of changes which uh, don't seem to be equitable across the council, don't seem to be equitable across the political balance, frankly, um, and and I, I fear uh, um, are, are not sensible. I think we should either um, accept the IPR. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, review or, uh, or, or or not go for these these changes at all and I certainly don't think that uh, um, it's being uh, um, applied sensibly. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Hadley. Councillor Mike Brook please. Fine, thank you Chair. Um, surprisingly I do agree with the comment or some of the comments that Councillor Stribley made and actually agree with one or two of the comments um, from Councillor Broadhead, Broadhead, especially the fact that uh, this isn't really the time uh, in the middle of a pandemic to uh, be dealing with this issue. However, um, I look at what's been presented to us and I, I have to say I am actually astounded at the doubling of the lead members uh, allowance that is being put forward through this amendment. They don't take on the responsibility of decision making and therefore I think the amount submitted by the independent panel is a far more appropriate and realistic uh, amount. The second point is while or well, third point really while ever um, this particular amendment does adjust and reduce the leaders and the cabinet members um, allowances relatively, as was uh, promised by the the leader. Um, it's this lead member doubling that I cannot accept, and I will be voting against this particular amendment. But also, I will be voting against the recommendation of the independent panel, because what that does is effectively mean that the basic allowance is subsidising to a significant extent the um, lead members um, allowance that is being quoted there and I can't agree with that. It would mean that the, the promise that the leader made uh, is not fulfilled, i.e. that the contribution should come from the leader and cabinet. So from my own point of view, three things. It's the wrong time because of the pandemic. 
and the suffering and struggles that many, many of our residents have through loss of jobs or reduced earnings through furlough, through having to um, self-isolate and so on. The amendment is just bizarre um, and certainly gives the Leave members uh, an allowance which is way beyond the responsibility that they actually have. And thirdly, I, I can't, as I say, I can't support the um, other one as well because that does not deal with the issue of where the money for the Leave members actually comes from. And finally, there's no indication here as to exactly how much this particular version costs. Is it cost neutral? Is it uh, more than the one uh, from the independent panel? The leader has told us not a penny about how much this particular proposal is going to cost. Thank so, you, Councillor Brook. Thank you, Councillor Brook. Uh, members, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Councillor Mark Howell to speak. He he placed an RTS uh, some while ago in the in the um, in the chat panel um and uh and didn't uh raise his hand so uh councillor howell I'll, I'll um allow you to speak now please yeah before the clock starts can i just ask a question about procedure um uh, i wish to quote uh councillor mellers a part a section of councillor mellers speech to the last council and i have that on video and i'd like to share that through my screen so that people can see it i think that would be probably part of your three minutes I would have thought. I yes. have to yes. it's be part of my three minutes but obviously at the moment I don't have the ability to share because that is has to be granted by the uh, by your permission. Just get on with it. No I I, I I I need the 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 computer to be enabled because we are as a matter of default uh, not allowed to share unless the settings are changed. So I, I need the democratic officer to change the settings. Councillor Howell, I understand that uh, you have to be added as a presenter. So officers are just trying to. Uh, right, you should be able to now uh, share with uh, members. Right, can you see that? Can everybody see that? I can see that. Play this and then I'll speak, but thank you. Can't hear it. I can't hear it, uh, uh, Councillor Howell. Okay. Well, okay. I, yeah, I, it, it, it's beyond belief what has happened and being proposed now. It, uh, Councillor Trent has already explained that the, the, the total cost of the lead members uh, is sixty thousand pounds, and um, you know the, the the compensatory amount is only thirty thousand pounds. So, so we are being asked as a council to contribute an extra. Uh, thirty thousand uh, pounds to essentially cabinet responsibilities, and uh, although people may not have heard that extract from the last meeting in his speech to 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 be nominated uh, and accepted as leader of the council, the the, the current leader said that uh, the lead member positions would be fully funded out of the SRAs of the leader in the cabinet. Uh, and that is not happening. And he's trying to push this through quickly because he knows he's being, um, you know, he's breaking a promise, breaking a promise that he made to full council uh, uh, in, in his election speech. I mean, ha that is a complete lack of integrity there, you know. Um, and indeed, the creation, in my view, the creation of the lead member positions uh, is corrupting the council system. It, it, it's a, it's in essence an act of patronage, trying to ex, to increase the number of people uh, that are beholden to uh, to the administration uh, and cement their position. 
Um, you know, it, it, these are the behaviours of an authorita authoritative, authoritarian dictator, a king, not not a not a democratic leader. Um, uh, uh, and uh, it, you know, it, it just it just cannot be acceptable. And I would ask the members of his party, you know, are you really prepared to stand behind your leader doing this, making a promise to full council that 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 this would be covered out of the uh, SRAs uh, of the cabinet, uh, and you know that, uh, and, and it will no doubt be publicised more widely when people see that clip. You know that that's what he said, and you've seen from what what people have been saying from 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 the the ruling party, they that you you seem to be prepared to just forget about that and let him get away with it. It's disgraceful. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you, Chairman. Would you, Chairman, would you be on, kind enough Chairman, to stop sharing your screen, please? Chairman, on a point of much. on a point of order, I really object to some of the language being used tonight. I mean, it really is wrong. Several times it's been referred to seedy behaviour, things stink, and now things have been given as because they're to, to make people beholden to the leader. I have no idea which point of order it is. But this is really not the sort of behaviour that we want to be broadcast uh, thank, over, thank our, you. over thank, our airways. Th thank you, uh, Councillor. I will uh, speak to the officers to uh, to get some uh, legal advice. Thank you. Uh, right, members, I'm going to ask um, the monitoring officer to uh, address the council. Susan, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, evening again, members. I just wanted to mention that when raising a point of order, please could members mention the um, section of the, of the Constitution that they believe has been breached, because then that allows officers to identify what the point of order actually is and advise the chair properly. So thank you very much. If you could do that, I'm afraid. Chairman, it's difficult at home. I haven't got a copy of the Constitution, but the sort of language which has been used tonight is not what any of us, no matter who we are, would want to go out over the airways. Uh, Chief Executive, please. Thank you, Chairman. Ap apologies. Uh, we, we can only work within the constitution that we have. We've, we have said many times before the process for a point of order. It's listed in section 14. It does say a point of order shall relate only to an alleged breach of a procedure rule or statutory provision, and the councillor shall specify the procedure rule or statutory provision and the way in which they consider it has been breached. That is very clear in our constitution. The, if the chairman wishes to to uh, allow something different, that is fine. But can I ask councillors to please comply with the constitution when raising points of order? It is very clear. It is written in a very clear way. I think we have to do that unless you specifically ask the ask the chairman whether you can raise a point of, of order without doing that. And then that's at the chairman's discretion. Thank you, Chief Executive. Right. Uh, it's getting late and I would really like to move things on. Uh, Councillor Diana Butler, please. Thank you, Chairman. I was just going to suggest, um, would we be able to vote on um, the recommendations from the panel just on the B section, which is just for the basic allowance increase, and then vote on the, the rest at a later date, maybe January. We're, I think we're due to meet 5th of January, something like that, which isn't long. Would that be possible to take it in sections? Uh, Councillor Butler, I would be happy for um, the original recommendation to be taken uh, uh, in, in parts, but we have an amendment on the table 
uh, this this is the the issue. So uh, we need to get to the point where we will vote on the amendment as to whether or not the council wishes to accept the amendment. But I, I do understand uh, what you're saying, Councillor uh, Butler. So we, we are debating the amendment at the moment. So uh, the sooner we can get uh, members' views on this um, out of the way, we can move on. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm being told there's a point of order on the chat bar. Just bear with me, Council. Members are going to hand, hand over to the monitoring officer uh, once more. OK, you're going to be tired of me soon, but I'll try and I'll try and unpick this. So we had the report of the independent remuneration panel. That specific recommendation wasn't moved by anyone at this meeting, but the leader proposed some, uh, we're calling them amendments, but proposed a different recommendation to the one that the remuneration panel put forward. So it would be quite proper for members if they wanted to, to propose an alternative amendment. You know, I've seen in the chat bar some um, instances of members wanting to possibly propose something different. So I don't see any reason procedurally why we couldn't do that if that would help to unblock the discussion this evening. Thank you. Or, of course, the leader could uh, def um, what he's put on the table, uh, even though we've, we, he has been requested to do that once uh, once before. OK, uh, Councillor Nigel Brooks, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, it's now half past ten and uh, there's some colourful language as we've been through this um, debate. I felt it right to uh, speak as a, a lead member supporting uh, the Cabinet and particularly uh, Councillor Phil Broadbent. Um, it is quite interesting that the role I've been given is lead member for BCP, for retail strategy and for Christchurch regeneration. Just unpacking that a bit for you, we're clear that in the current circumstances in terms of what our towns face in the retail dilemma and uh, the COVID pandemic, it's d delivered a body blow to our retailers and businesses. But this is just the latest challenges in recent years. Uh, we're already seeing them under pressure caused by consumer spending, intense competition and online retailing, as well as out of town retail parks and free park car, park on, car parking. I'm finding this an immense challenge in only three, four weeks in the number of people I'm speaking to, the number of people who want to come and speak to me and the depth of problems that people are experiencing. We're all going through it in different stages in this pandemic. And the role that I've been given, based on my uh, experience as a chartered surveyor, uh, particularly with retail asset management of schemes throughout the UK, this is quite a task for the whole of our conurbation. And it should not be sort of seen as being something as an add-on. It's a full-time role to try and actually bring transformation to our towns which are badly suffering. So I'm going to hold my hand up for this role. 
I'm not particularly concerned about the level of remuneration. I'm concerned that you appreciate the role of having a lead member, and there are a number of of us who are having to work very hard to actually try and make a difference and bring stability to our conurbation. And that goes for employment, that goes for the well-being, and that goes for the prosperity of people that we are serving. So I, I would just ask you not to underestimate the challenges that lead members are going to have to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Brooks. Uh, Councillor Mike Green, please. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I had my hand up before I heard the suggestions about acts of patronage, etc., which I think were uh, were really quite uncalled for. But um, certainly, Councillor Filer made that point. Uh, the point that I wanted to make was a very simple one. I am amazed at how many members of the council seem to know exactly what the role of a lead member is and how much work they're putting in. I'm actually equally amazed at how much of my time as a cabinet member I'm spending speaking to lead members. And if they're spending all that time speaking to me and they're spending that same sort of time speaking to the other nine members and the officers and trying to pull it all together, they are doing an incredible job. I'm being asked under this amendment to take a cut to my um, councillors, my, my cabinet member SRA, um, to put towards the lead members. When I look at the amount of work that I am doing and I look at the amount of work that they're doing, I judge that that is fair. The lead members have already shown that they are required and will stand up to the task of, with a huge amount of work. I believe that they will be very valuable as we go forward. I believe that they are worth it. And I really wish that people who have not seen them working in this way didn't disparage them in the way that they are doing during this debate. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor David Brown, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I'm surprised by how substantive this amendment from the leader is. Um, you know, the independent reviewing panel probably spent about seven months working on their research and questioning and discussion. The council papers are sent out to members and the press and the public about seven days before the meeting. And then we're given about, that's all ripped up, it's got rid of, and we're given about seven minutes to think about actually a wholly new proposal without being given all of the information. Councillor Broadhead mentioned earlier about the financial implications of the independent review and panel report and for, for the council taxpayers. That's all well and good, and I'd probably agree with some of what some of what he said. But the original report that we were given actually detailed the financial implications of those recommendations. What we've just had from the leader does not include the financial implications. We can all sit here and try and on the back of a fag packet work out what it is, but we need to understand the impact on allowances, on national insurance payments. We don't know how much these changes will cost, whether that's within this year's budget or whether it's over the budget. It looks like it's over the budget. If it's over the budget, where is that money coming from? What other cuts have we got to make to compensate for that? You know, council taxpayers don't know how much it will be cost. It will cost them for this amendment as a point of good decision making. And it talks about it in the Constitution that when decisions are made, it should consider the financial implications as a point of good decision making and good governance of taxpayers money. We should not be asked to make a decision to report without knowing the full financial implications for the council and for the council taxpayer. This amendment should be withdrawn until we are provided with all of that information because we just are not informed enough to make this decision tonight because those figures haven't been given to us. It's not a good decision making way of doing it. So this should be withdrawn until we have that information. No member on this meeting has that information at this time. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Bobby Dove, please. Councillor Dove. Uh, yes, thank you. Obviously, I was um, proposing to stay out of the debate, um, given that I am a lead member and I appear to be the subject of quite a few um, conversations this evening from Dorset Pension Boards and obviously today of the lead member. I feel compelled to speak today quite simply because my residents are listening to this. My residents have heard me tonight being described as um, lacking integrity. Um, corruption due to being beholden to our leader. Um, 
this is disgusting. I have read in the paper that my vote was bought with my position. I mean, I've never come under so much personal attack for doing so much for what I think is the right thing for this council. And I would really hope that there would be some understanding that not only do you get me for um, this allowance, this SRA, whatever it may well be, you get it at what um, the leader of the council is proposing at £27 a day. Now, I work seven days a week at the moment. I'm sending emails at seven o'clock in the morning right the way through to two o'clock in the morning. I have worked so far on the culture compact paper, the housing paper, the parts pitch strategy, the disabled um, PCA standards for play parks. I'm, I'm rewriting our assessment inquiries. I'm working to try to get a standard of excellence for equalities in our council. I speak to so many people all day and every day, and I hear everybody quite rudely without asking me exactly what is it that I'm doing with my time and also quite happy to disparage and besmirch all of the good work that myself and other lead members are doing. We are doing it because it's the right thing to do. We are doing it because actually this last administration left the council in such a mess, and that's partly why I'm so busy, because we've had to withdraw papers like the Culture Compact, like the Parks Pitch Strategy, which had inadequate consideration of disabled people and, and those with protected characteristics. And nobody has actually decided to ask us exactly what it is that we're doing. And it appears that the only people who seem to value the importance of what we bring to this council is our leader of the council and those that are on the cabinet that we work with day in, day out. And for that, I would like to thank them and everyone else who supported us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Marcus Andrews, please. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'll be brief. I would like to propose that the meeting this evening is adjourned because it is very late. We've got some important debates in theory that, that we were going to consider. Uh, they are important debates which uh, people have prepared for. But, you know, at this rate, it'll be tomorrow that the meeting will be finished. So I would propose, I hope I get a second term, that the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Andrews. Um, do I have a seconder for uh, Councillor Andrews' proposal, please, members? I have a seconder in uh, Councillor Farquhar. So, members, it has been proposed and seconded uh, that this evening's meeting be adjourned. Uh, and what I will do is I'll hand over to uh, uh, the Chief Executive to, to conduct the vote. Thank you, members. Thank you. Chairman, I wonder if I can just ask, could, could we just check whether anybody wishes to vote against adjournment? Because that might be simpler than doing the full vote through. Yes, I'd like to vote against the adjournment. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, in which case, Chief thank Executive. you very much. Let's, let's do the vote. Okay. Chief Executive, um, I wonder if we could ask for some clarity. Certainly. Uh, sorry, I'll, let me hand back to the Chairman then, in that case. Uh, apologies. Green. Thank you, um, and, um, and apologies for uh, just speaking. I was madly waving my hands and clearly it doesn't work um, uh, on Teams. I just wonder if you could give members some clarity around where this discussion sits um, in order that we can vote appropriately um, on, the, uh, on whether or not to adjourn the meeting. Does that mean that this, um, the proposal which has been made um, uh, rests and we return to the debate under the usual rules of debate and therefore that nobody who has already spoken will be allowed to speak subsequently? Um, or are we to look at something else? Is the meeting adjourned? Is the is the motion adjourned? It's a slightly peculiar time to adjourn a meeting. Okay. Time. I have I have sympathy for um, Councillor Andrews and, and what he's trying to achieve, but I do just think we need to know where we stand for when we come back in order to vote appropriately. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Green. I'm going to take advice from the monitoring officer.
Uh, members, right, my understanding is that if the meeting is adjourned, uh, when we reconvene, uh, the debate will continue and all those members who have already spoken would not have the opportunity to speak again. But I understand that uh, uh, that it, that could change at my discretion. Um, my, my view is, members, that I think that this amendment has come so late this evening uh, it's extremely emotive subject, and I think the best thing to do is a adjourn so that we can come back on a fresh day and uh, debate the uh, debate the item. So I'll hand over to the chief executive, and I trust that's answered your questions, uh, Councillor Green. It's answered them, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Order, please, Chair. We do have a couple of points of orders be being raised. Can we deal with them as appropriate? Uh, I, I saw a point of order raised by uh, Councillor Andrews. Was it Andrew? Sorry. There's Councillor Anderson. I raised the point Anderson, of order. Sorry. But Councillor Bartlett sorry. raised one before me, uh, Mr Chairman. OK, Councillor Bartlett, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm not quite sure of what the, the actual motion or constitution order is, but I believe that we can call for a, a motion now to be put to Council. Uh, the uh, or vote vote now on a motion that's been put and the recommendations have been made. There's been a huge debate about it. I think we're now in a position where we should vote on the uh, amendment that uh, the leader has put before us. So, Chairman, if I may, that, that, that may be true, but we now have a motion to adjourn the meeting on the table. So if the if the motion be put, it will be the motion to adjourn that would be put. Thank you, Chief Executive. That's, my, that's not my attention, intention, though, no, Chief Executive. No, no, I gather that. Chairman, my, uh, my point of order was at exactly the same point as Councillor Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Councillor Anderson. So, uh, at the, the moment, I think we have a motion to adjourn the meeting. On the only alternative would be for the mover of that motion to withdraw that, but uh, I'm not seeing that coming through. So I'm suggesting that we move to the vote on the adjournment. Thank you, Chief Executive. Okay, sure. so okay, so Councillor, I'm taking a vote on uh, a motion to adjourn the meeting uh, to a date to be determined. Uh, if you are in favour of the adjournment, please say four. If you are against it, please say against if the uh, alternative is to abstain. Uh, Councillor Hazel Allen. Against. No. Councillor Lewis Allison. No. Against. No. Sorry, Councillor Allison, can I confirm that was against? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Mark Anderson. Against. Councillor Sarah Anderson. Come on. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. My mic. My mic. So, Councillor Sarah Anderson. Oh. Sorry, Councillor Anderson. If I pass her over to my mic, she can speak through this one. Uh, I'm trying to type a message now. So, I can oh. hear you now, Councillor Anderson. We can hear you trying to type. <laughs> so, are you voting for or against? Against, thank you. Councillor Marcus Andrews. Uh, for. Councillor Julie Bagwell. Against. Councillor Steve Barron. For. Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Against. Councillor John Beasley. Against. Waste of time. Councillor yeah. Derek Borthwick. <sighs> Councillor Derek Borthwick. Your mic's on. It's on, yeah. Where are Four. Four. So, Four. Councillor Four. Thank you. Councillor Philip Broadhead. Against. Councillor Mike Brook. Four. <coughs> Four. Thank you. Councillor Nigel Brooks. Four. Deferment. Four. Deferment. Thank you. Councillor David Brown. Four. Councillor Simon Bull. Four. Councillor Richard Burton. Four. Councillor Diana Butler. Four. Councillor Daniel Butts. 
Against. Councillor Judy Butt. Against. Councillor Eddie Coop. Against. Councillor Mike Cox. For. Councillor Malcolm Davis. Against. Councillor Norman Decent. Councillor Norman Decent. Against. Thank you. Councillor Leslie Dedman. For. Councillor Brian Dion. Against. Councillor Bobby Dove. Against. Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Against. Councillor Millie Earl. For. Councillor Jackie Edwards. Sorry, not here. Councillor LJ Evans. Against. Uh, Councillor George Farquhar. For. Councillor Dwayne Farr. Against. Yeah, Councillor Lawrence Fear. Against. Councillor Anne Filer. Against. Councillor David Flagg. For. Councillor Nick Geary. For. Councillor Mike Green. Against. And Councillor Nicola Green. Against. Okay, Councillor Andy Hadley. For. Okay, Councillor May Haynes. Against. Councillor Peter Hall. Say again. Say again. Four. Thank you. Councillor Nigel Hedges. Against. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Four. Councillor Mark Howell. Four. Councillor Mohan Ainga. Against. Councillor Cheryl Johnson. Against. Councillor Toby Johnson. Four. Councillor Andy Jones. Against. Councillor Jane Kelly. Against. Councillor David Kelsey. Against. Councillor Bob Lawton. Against. Councillor Marin Le Pedvin. Four. Councillor Lisa Lewis. Four. Councillor Rachel Maidment. Four. Councillor Chris Matthews. Four. Councillor Simon McCormack. Against. Councillor Drew Meller. Against. Councillor Pete Miles. For. Councillor Sandra Moore. For. Councillor Lisa Northover. For. Councillor Tony O'Neill. Against. Councillor Susan Phillips. Councillor Susan Phillips. Uh, Councillor Phillips, are you still with us? I'll come back to Councillor Phillips. Councillor Margaret Phipps? For. Councillor Karen Rampton? Against. Uh, Councillor Felicity Rice? For. Councillor Chris Rigby? For. Councillor Mark Robson? For. Councillor Roberto Rocco. Against. Yeah, Councillor Vicky Slade. Sorry, four. Yeah, Councillor Anne Stribley. Councillor Anne Stribley. Come back to Councillor Stribley, Councillor Tony Trent. Against. Councillor Mike White. Against. Councillor Lawrence Williams. Against. Councillor Kieran Wilson. For. And can I try again, please, with Councillor Susan Phillips? Councillor Phillips, are you on the line? And Councillor Anne Stribley, are you able to connect? Okay, I'm not recording votes at the moment for either Councillor Susan Phillips or Councillor Stribley. Okay, I'll report those, those that outcome to the chairman. Thanks.
Thank you, members. Um, I'm able to uh, report that uh, the vote is lost, uh, so we will carry on with the debate. Uh, next to speak, uh, Councillor Anne Foyler, please. Uh, one moment. Uh, sorry, Councillor Foyler, I've, I've got a point of order being raised by uh, Councillor uh, Nicola Green. Thank you, Councillor Nicola Green. Thank you, Chairman. I would like to, not having spoken in the debate so far, I would like to move to the vote and seek a seconder for that proposal. I'll second I'll that. Second that. I'll second that. Councillor Bobby Double seconds. OK, uh, members, I will now hand, hand over to uh, the uh, chief executive to conduct the vote. Um, chief executive. Thank you, Chairman. So I'm just checking the constitution that under um, Paragraph 13B, uh, the, the, the question be now put, I think, is the motion that's that's been put. Um, so if you're happy the motion has been sufficiently discussed, uh, then it, the closure motion effectively now goes to the vote. So we're voting on whether to move uh, to the conclusion and to the vote. Uh, if that is passed, then the mover of the original motion gets the right of reply. Then we move straight to the, to the motion. So I'm now going to take a vote on moving uh, effectively the, the question now be put that's that's the move so if you are in favor of the question being put and moving to that vote uh, please vote for if you're against that please vote again of course the, the option is to abstain so starting again uh, with a councillor hazel sorry, allen sorry sorry, sorry. Uh, mr chief executive i'm so sorry it's councillor oh, mr through you mr chairman um, I'm afraid that we're all very confused. Okay. Uh, we seem to have an awful lot of votes here. We've just voted down the adjournment. Surely we go back to the substantive and put the amendment to vote for the amendment. What's the bit in between? Sorry, very confused. Sorry, so, so somebody has put somebody's put a motion that the question should now be put, and uh, that ha effectively has to be voted on. Um, I suppose the question is: Is anybody against that motion? If everybody was in favour, then we wouldn't have to do a name and a sort of a roll call vote. But at the moment, the the motion that's down is that the question now be put. I have to get the council's agreement. We would then move to the vote on the substantive motion with with no further debate, just the right of reply of the of the proposer, Councillor Meller. Thank you, Could, Mr. Chief Secretary. Thanks. Can I just check? Is is anybody going to vote against the motion now being put? Yes. 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 Yes, I will vote okay. against. In which, in which case, Chairman, can I suggest that we take that vote then? So this is this is a vote on the motion now being put. So if you are in favour of the motion now being put and moving to that, please say for. If you're against that, please vote against. Uh, so, Councillor Hazel Allen. For moving to the vote. For, thank you. Councillor Lewis Allison. For. Sorry, Councillor Allison, could you repeat? For. Four, thank you. Councillor Mark Anderson. Four. Councillor Sarah Anderson. Four. Councillor Marcus Andrews. Four. Councillor Julie Bagwell. Four. Councillor Steve Barron. Four. Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Four. Councillor John Beasley. Four. Councillor Derek Borthwick. Four. Councillor Philip Broadhead. Four. Councillor Mike Brook. Against. Councillor Nigel Brooks. Four. Councillor David Brown. Four. Councillor Simon Bull. Four. Councillor Richard Burton. Four. Councillor Diana Butler. 
Four. Councillor Daniel Butt. Four. Councillor Judy Butt. Four. Councillor Eddie Coop. Four. Thank you, Councillor Mike Cox. Against. Councillor Malcolm Davies. Four. Councillor Norman Decent. Four. Councillor Leslie Dedman. Four. Councillor Brian Dion. Four. Councillor Bobby Dove. Sorry, four. Thank you, Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Four. Councillor Millie Earl. Against. Councillor Jackie. No, <laughs> Councillor LJ Evans. Against. Councillor George Farquhar. Against. Councillor Dwayne Farr. Four. Councillor Lawrence Fear. Four. Councillor Anne Filer. Four. Councillor David Flagg. Four. Councillor Nick Geary. Come on, get yourself in game. Councillor Nick Geary. Four. Thank you. Councillor Mike Green. Four. Councillor Nicola Green. Four. Councillor Andy Hadley. Four. Councillor May Haynes. Four. Councillor Peter Hall. Four. Thank you. Councillor Nigel Hedges. Four. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Four. Councillor Mark Howell. Against. Councillor Mohan Anger. Four. Councillor Cheryl Johnson. Four. Councillor Toby Johnson. Against. Councillor Andy Jones. Four. Councillor Jane Kelly. Four. Councillor David Kelsey. Four. Councillor Bob Lawton. Four. Chairman, we, we've exceeded a majority. Do you want me to carry on through that? There is a majority in favour for by some distance. I don't know whether you'd like me to carry on through. I can do, but it would. I'm, whether... I'm happy. The member's happy that uh, we are over the, the point uh, in agreed, terms of. Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do, do any councillors who are who are L or later in the alphabet wish to record a particular vote one way or want to have that on the record? Or can we move on? Oh, I'd like to record my vote against. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor okay. Trent. Thank you, Chairman. So if I hand back to you uh, to allow the move of the motion, Councillor Mallard, speak again, and then we move straight to the substantive vote. Uh, thank you, Chief Executive. Uh, Councillor Mellor, please. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you very much, councillors. Um, you know, some of the parts of that debate have been have been um, have been cleared up. This isn't my paper. Um, the first time I saw this paper when it was published published live. Uh, on so uh, absolutely, this isn't my paper. Um, I'm actually I'm not sure if I'm surprised or not, but the absolute hypocrisy from um, from our Labour and Lib Dem colleagues. You know, we've had uh, one member of Labour say. Um, you know, should we just go ahead and, you know, is it rude to amend the paper when he's in the press today saying how he plans to put an amendment to his paper? So that's a Labour hypocrisy. We've had the Lib Dem hypocrisy when we, we, we're saying, well, why has this come at the last minute when last week I reached out to the leader of the, of the opposition, Miliel, who decided not to um, respond to my email about discussing this. So, um, you know, it, it's absolute smoke and mirrors, you know, in, in terms of the, the, the faux outrage that we're seeing from from the, op the opposition of various parts of it. Let's have a little bit of a recap. Let's get to some facts. So what are we saying here? What's in this amendment? It's a pay freeze. This is not the time to be having an increase in our salaries. Um, we, we heard from another member of the Poor People Party how they should just move the, you know, the, the agreement with the IRP. So the Poor People Party wants to spend £150,000 more on members' allowances at a time of crisis. It, it, honestly, I'm shocked by it. Um, what, what else is in this paper, uh, this amendment? Reductions in the SRA for the entire executive you know, function. A significant in re reduction you know, for, from, from the leader. What, what else is in this amendment? A significantly lower, you know, total sum than the IRP recommendation. You know, talk about political spin. Is, this is a net nil um, uh, policy, uh, effectively, with the uh, reductions in the SRAs from, from the executive function and the pay freeze overall. This is a net nil you know, um, rise. 
uh, I'm very, very comfortable to, to, to move this um, uh, to the vote, uh, Chair, and I look forward to uh, Council's vote on it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Right, OK, I will hand over to the Chief Executive to uh, uh, con conduct the vote. Chief Executive, please. Thank you, Chairman. So we're now voting on the substantive motion as proposed by Councillor Miller. Uh, so if you're in favour of that, please vote for. If you're against it, please vote against. Of course, the alternative is to abstain. Again, in alphabetical order, uh, starting with Councillor Hazel Allen. For. Councillor Lewis Allison. Councillor Mark Anderson. For. Councillor Sarah Anderson. For. Thank you, Councillor Marcus Andrews. Against. Councillor Julie Bagwell. For. Councillor Steve Barron. Abstain. Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Against. Councillor John Beasley. For. Councillor Derek Borthwick. For. Councillor Philip Broadhead. For. Councillor Mike Brook. Against. Councillor Nigel Brooks. For. Councillor David Brown. Against. Councillor Simon Bull. Against. Councillor Richard Burton. Against. Councillor Diana Butler. Abstain. Councillor Daniel Butt. For. Councillor Judy Butt. For. Councillor Eddie Coop. For. Councillor Mike Cox. Against. Councillor Malcolm Davies. For. Councillor Norman Decent. For. Councillor Leslie Dedman. Against. Councillor Brian Deal. For. Councillor Bobby Dove. For. Councillor Beverly Dunlop. For. Councillor Millie Earle. Against. Councillor LJ Evans. Against. Councillor George Farquhar. Against. Councillor Dwayne Farr. For. Councillor Lawrence Fear. For. Councillor Anne Filer. For. Councillor David Flagg. Against. Councillor Nick Geary. Against. Councillor Mike Green. For. Councillor Nicola Green. For. Councillor Andy Hadley. Against. Councillor May Haynes. For. Councillor Peter Hall. For. Thank you. Councillor Nigel Hedges. For. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Against. Councillor Mark Howell. Against. Councillor Mohan Ainger. For. Councillor Cheryl Johnson. For. Councillor Toby Johnson. Against. Councillor Andy Jones. For. Councillor Jane Kelly. For. Councillor David Kelsey. For. Councillor Bob Lawton. For. Councillor Marion LePedvin. Against. Councillor Lisa Lewis. Against. Councillor Rachel Maidment. Abstain. Councillor Chris Matthews. Against. Councillor Simon McCormack. Against. Councillor Drew Meller. For. Councillor Pete Miles. Against. Councillor Sandra Moore. Against. Councillor Lisa Northover. Against. Councillor Tony O'Neill. For. Councillor Susan Phillips. For. Thank you. Councillor Margaret Phipps. Against. Councillor Karen Rampton. For. Councillor Felicity Rice. Against. Councillor Chris Rigby. Against. And can that be recorded, please? Councillor Mark Robson. Against. Councillor Roberto Rocco. For. Councillor Vicky Slade. Against. Councillor Anne Stribley. So, Councillor Anne Stribley, if we uh, I think we've got no response, I'm trying to rejoin. Okay. Um, Councillor Tony Trent. Against. Councillor Mike White. For. Councillor Lawrence Williams. For. And Councillor Kieran Wilson. Against. Thank you. We'll advise the chairman of the result. Thank you.
Thank you, members. Um, I can report that that, uh, that vote is, is carried. So moving on then to agenda item nine, uh, calendar of meetings. Uh, can I call upon the uh, leader, Councillor Mellor, please? Yeah, yes, Chair. Thank, thank you very much uh, for, for that. In terms of the calendar, calendar of meetings, very simple, um, it's, it, as is in front of us. Um, I would like to make a recommendation to um, uh, recommendation C be amended to say that delegated authority is given to the chair of a licensing committee committee to review and agree date. Other than that, I propose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mellor. Do we have a seconder at all? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Happy to second. I'm conscious that we've got very important things still to talk about tonight, such as badges and fireworks, so I'll just keep it at that and second the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Kelsey. Yeah, sorry, Chairman. I was actually going to propose that we defer the rest of this meeting now that we've got that one through. It's getting very late. Members obviously do not have much of a capacity anymore to make sensible and proper judgments on things. So I feel it will be better for the residents of Bournemouth and Paul and Christchurch if we defer the rest of this meeting until a further date. Uh, do you have a second, uh, Councillor Kelsey? I so second, Mr Chairman. That's Councillor Butt. was happy to second that. Uh, I'll object to that assertion. Yeah, me, I wouldn't vote for that. You'll have your opportunity when it comes to a vote. OK, uh, it's been proposed and seconded. I will now hand over to the Chief Executive to conduct the vote. Thank you, Chief Executive. Can we allow the Chief Executive to dispense with the councillor on every word? Thank, thank you, Councillor. It just didn't feel right to me when I did it the first time. So um, if members would prefer me to, to, to do it an all-inclusive councillors and then just use names, that, that's fine. I will give it another go. Whatever you're happy with, uh, Graham. I'm yes. probably happier saying councillor, but I'm going to give it a yeah. go without it for, for brevity. <laughs> go <laughs> for it. So collective councillors, uh, you're voting for uh, a, a, the motion to adjourn uh, or against if you don't wish to adjourn the meeting. Um, so councillors, Hazel Allen. For. Lewis Allison. For. Mark Anderson. For. Sarah Anderson. Four. Marcus Andrews. Councillor Marcus Andrews. Oh, sorry, abstain. Okay. Uh, Julie Bagwell. Four. Steve Barron. Four. Stephen Bartlett. Against. John Beasley. Four. Uh, Derek Borthwick. Four. Philip Broadhead. Four. Mike Brook. Against. Nigel Brooks. Four. David Brown. Against. Simon Bull. Four. Richard Burton. Against. Diana Butler. Four. Daniel Butt. Four. Judy Butt. Four. Eddie Coop. Four. Mike Cox. Against. Malcolm Davies. Four. Norman Decent. Four. Leslie Debman. Four. Ryan Dion. Four. Bobby Dove. Four. Beverly Dunlop. Four. Billy Earl. Again. Jackie. Oh, LJ Evans. <laughs> Against. Uh, George Farquhar. Against. Dwayne Farr. Four. Lawrence Fear. Four. Anne Filer. Four. Uh, David Flagg. Against. Nick Geary. Four. Mike Green. Four. Nicola Green. Four. Andy Hadley. And um, against. May Haynes. Four. Peter Hall. Four. Nigel Hedges. Four. So, Councillor Hedges, can I just confirm that was four? Four. Yep, thank you. Paul Hilliard. Four. Uh, Mark Howell. Against. Mohan Ainger. Four. 
Joe Johnson. So Cheryl Johnson. Come back, Toby Johnson. Against. Okay. Uh, Andy Jones. Four. Jane Kelly. Four. David Kelsey. Four. Bob Lawton. Four. Marion Lepedvin. Against. Lisa Lewis. Four. Rachel Maybent. Against. Chris Matthews. Against. Simon McCormack. Against. Drew Miller. Four. Pete Miles. Against. Sandra Moore. Against. Lisa Northover. Against. Tony O'Neill. Four. Susan Phillips. Councillor Susan Phillips. Four. Four. Thank you. Thank you. Margaret Phipps. Four. Karen Rampton. Four. Felicity Rice. Against. Chris Rigby. Against. Mark Robson. Against. Roberto Rocco. Four. Vicky Slade. Against. Anne Stribley. Not come back in as yet. Uh, Tony Trent. Against. Mike White. Four. And Lawrence Williams. Four. And sorry, and Kieran Wilson. Against. And can I just go back to Cheryl Johnson? Okay. I'll pass the results through to the chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, members. Um, the vote has been carried, uh, 45 votes to 25 with one abstention, and I believe two members were unable to contact. Uh, so the meet this evening's meeting is adjourned, and we will make every effort to find a, uh, a convenient evening uh, to uh, reconvene this side of Christmas. Uh, thank you, members. Thank you.